prominent people of this university and the most prominent professors in Greek academia. And I say that with um, uh, accuracy, scientific accuracy. I've been honored to be part of this university and two of the most important reasons for this are Professor Christodoulakis and Professor Xebabadeas. And I think all of us feel uh, and understand uh, this. I will stop talking about Nikos because I was not allocated the task. My task is to talk about Tassos. And I will not talk about Tassos because we have an amazing list of speakers that will do that. I will just say that Tassos has been one of the most important reasons for the brain drain, the reversal of brain drain in this university and across Greece. He has been the proof that you can develop a top rank academic career, a world class academic career from Greece. And we have very few examples of this. And Dasos is probably the most prominent one. Dasos is an international member of the, e, uh, of the US Academy of Sciences. He has been chair of the board of Bayer Institute for Ecological Economics under the auspices of the Swedish Academy of Science. He has been president of the European Association of Environmental Resource Economists. And actually with art, they found with they both been past presidents they actually built the ecosystem of this association. At the moment, this is the most prestigious and biggest scientific association in the world on environmental economics. And these two guys basically put it together. And we are all grateful for them. And I'm also uh, humbled by the fact that I am the current president, I, I'm sure, uh, all of the um, presidents of these associations are in depth, serious in depth to both of them. Tasso's work ranges from spatial economics and part, pattern formation, optimal control and games, mostly applied to environmental issues effects of risk and ambiguity on uh, economic dynamics, socio-ecological adaptive systems, environmental policy and market structure, and much more. But I would say that these are the main focuses now, and these will be the main focus of the special issue that Ian Bainman was delighted to host at our association journal, the official journal of the um, uh, European Association of Environmental Resource Economics. All the participants of this workshop, but also anybody else who is interested to submit a paper will be very welcome. It will be a special issue that Ian will announce and it will be essays in order of Tasos Xebabadeas. So, I will stop talking, although I am notorious about talking too much, and I will first give the floor to the General Secretary of the Academy of Athens, Professor Zerefos, who has worked with Tassos and who has insisted that he has to talk about him today. And I'm delighted that he is on board. Professor Zerefos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Phoebe. <clears throat> uh, Dear Tassos, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gents, it is a, a great pleasure to me to say a few words on this uh, prestigious, small though, ceremony for 
tassels xepapadeas. I met tassels about 14 years ago, maybe 15, when uh, actually we were called, uh, I was called by the Academy of Athens and tassels through me uh, by the Bank of Greece to start a report referring to the consequences, um, ecological, environmental, and economic of man-made climate change in our country, in Greece, <clears throat> in a fairly large detail. The product of our joint work has been published in 2011, which is 11 years ago. And uh, it was uh, the product of heavy work, uh, great uncertainties that we envisaged. And uh, Tassos indeed has proven to be a real researcher, a wonderful person to work with. And uh, it turned out that I can say a wonderful friend also. Uh, <clears throat> we in uh, research, because I'm one of you, we really appreciate the work that has been done, particularly in what relates to our work by other disciplines. So the interdisciplinarity of climate change and uh, the, the great osmosis that has not been done. It was a fascinating challenge, both to Tassos, myself, and the other 40 professors who all gathered uh, to the good of our society and uh, to the interest of uh, science, a science that it is still in its infancy, and I'm talking about the economics of climate change. Tassos has uh, proven capabilities in uh, tackling difficult issues, in researching, in uh, even in murky waters in uh, science, and not only in his own discipline, which is economics, but also he eagers to put together what is all about nature. A good researcher, he's uh, looking like Tassos to the individual components that create the problem, and then he's solving a complex set of equations, I may say, or a system that it's usually nonlinear by parameterizing and by expend, ex, ex, expending lots of hours from his uh, uh, personal time, from his family to work with us. Tassos, may I wish you long live with health, with the same spirit and soul at the uniqueness that Tassos Xepapadeas has. Thank you so much for being with us. And I look forward uh, that if we are all healthy, of course, that we shall continue our collaboration to the future like we are now. And uh, to the many years to come, for as many years as, as we can physically. Thank you all. And we all enjoy Tassos. And uh, particularly, our students should get 
one of the best examples that they can find in Greece. Thank you. Thank you, Christo. Thank you so much for being here. Christos and Dasos are leading the Bank of Greece committee that uh, studies the effects of climate change on the Greek economy, and they are doing pioneering work, not only within Greece, but uh, across Europe and beyond. The rector of the university told me to remind everybody that he spoke about both of you, and he had to leave because of other businesses. So you can understand why he is not here now. But he spoke about both of you during the opening of, of the event. Art, the floor is yours. <laughs> Professor Art de Zou is one of the dearest and most prominent members of environmental economics community across the world. He has, as I talked before, a past president of the European Association and a prolific writer and a close friend to Dasos, please. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Does it work? Oh, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> it's an enormous honor, Phoebe, that I was invited and can speak to this in, on this special event of the retirement of actually both Nikos and Tassos. And um, I've decided to talk about differential gains. Um, maybe a bit unusual because um, we usually talk about environmental economics, but differential gains, I will try to show, is a very important methodology for environmental economics. Tassos likes it. We did a lot of work together. And, um, and actually, Nikos, this is the topic I got interested in when I met you in the early 80s, when we were young researchers in the computer lab in Cambridge. So there's lots of connections for this, uh, for this topic. Um, Tassos and I go together a long time. We met, uh, I think, watching a Champions League game in the lobby of an hotel in Venice, a very long time ago. Um, we got co -work we became co-workers, we became very good friends, and um, we managed to produce a lot of papers together. And I think Tassos, for both of us, the five or six most cited papers each one of us has are papers that we did together or together with other people. So that's quite a signal that this cooperation was, uh, was quite fruitful. And I'm very grateful for that. This picture actually is a picture on the famous boat to the Asker Island in Sweden, in Stockholm, where we met uh, every year in September with a group of economists and a group of ecologists to discuss some issue. And we tried and we mostly managed to publish the, some of our discussions. And this is also where we um, learned about the the lake model, and the lake model has become a very important part of our research agenda. I wanted to talk about uh, the lake model, but it's a very complicated thing. And um, I decided to, to move a little bit differently. And, um, and I like to refer to, a, to an interview um, that um, Ingmar Schumacher actually is uh, having interviews with all the top environmental economists and puts them on the website. And in Tassos' interview, he was asked what his favorite article is. And he mentioned two. And first, he mentioned a paper by, uh, by Dr. Engelbert, Dr. Jovan Long. And um, this was a paper on a differential game of international pollution control. And uh, Tassos was very interested in the ideas that were put forward because they managed to show that this game has multiple mark of perfect Nash equilibria. And I will try to tell you what it means. Right, so part of my story is try to tell you what it means, and then other part is that um, I want to show what Tassos and I have done with that, uh, with those insights. And um, unfortunately, both Engelbert Doctor and Jovan Long passed away, and um, but they left uh, this uh, this heritage that has been very important. But before I do that, I take the opportunity to go back a little bit in the history of differential games, because I think that many people do not really know what is all behind this. And, uh, and then talk about this game of international pollution control, where the doctor and long result is important, and then talk a little bit about the, uh, the late game that Tassos and I worked on together with others. 
Um, if you go in the history of differential games, there's a set of papers in the late 60s, early 70s, in the Journal of Optimization Theory and Applications, uh, two papers by Starr and Ho on Nash equilibria and two papers by Simon and Prudz on Stuckelberg equilibria. Um, sometimes I say everything happened 50 years ago, right? So then we have everything there already, more or less. And it also holds for, uh, for differential gains. And so Yuchi Ho was actually, I think, one of the founding fathers. And he was a professor both at MIT and Harvard. And in that time, in MIT and Harvard, um, System and control theory was a very important uh, area, very important field to system systematically model and analyze dynamics. And the concept of state is very important. And the state means that you play the game in a changing environment. And that's very relevant when you have general economic models where, where you have capital accumulation, but it's also very relevant when you have models in environmental economics where you, for example, have a pollution stock because the pollution stock is changing all the time. So your game is influenced by the change of your environment. That's one issue with the concept of state. The other issue is a sort of memory concept. Um, it's a Markovian concept in the sense that the state has all the information you need to be able to describe the future. But you can also say, if you do not need, know the whole state, you have just a few signals about it. What does it mean for your possibilities to control the future? And what was very surprising is that standard dynamical game theory is essentially stateless. So the whole game theory that developed in the 80s of the last century, as far as there's some, some dynamics there in repeated games, for example, but also in extensive form games, there's some dynamics, they don't use the concept of state. And that's in some sense strange because it's so logical. And it took a very, very long time before differential game theory became popular within economics because that at that time, that standard game theory was the driving force. The state concept wasn't considered very important. Um, so what is a differential game? So a differential game considers dynamical optimization under state transition. Okay, let's say the optimal control problem, very old problem. And uh, the second issue is that there's some form of strategic interaction that is important. So, for example, in economics, you have oligopolies, or you have policy governments and private agents playing a game together. You have international policy countries playing a game together. So if you have strategic interaction, we have some sort of dynamical optimization, the state transition, you have a differential game. And I think almost any issue, any dynamical issue you can think of within economics and environmental economics has that structure. So it's a bit strange that the thing has not become so much more popular, maybe because it's not easy. Okay, I will show you that this complicated stuff. Now, what was the, the main result that already was put forward by, um, by Starr and Ho in 1969, that they found out that what they called open loop solutions and feedback solutions, and again, this terminology comes from system and control theory, right, because that was where it was all developed. And um, that these things, if you, they, they would lead the same thing if you have just a, um, a control without uncertainty and without gaming. But if you do not have such thing, then the Nash equilibria will differ. That was the main result that Starr and Ho put forward. And people who know about game theory might think, yeah, but of course, in game theory, you have the same thing. We have the normal form and the extensive form, the similar thing. Not precisely. That Nash equilibria can differ in normal form and extensive form has something to do with extensive form and the dynamics and the information sets that they describe. But they don't have the concept of state and don't have the same uh, structure for this uh, for this type of analysis. But they did come um, with similar um, 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 important uh, insights. The idea of subgame perfectness that was put forward by Reinhard Selten in 1975 is very similar idea as the idea that feedback equilibria come forward when you put dynamic programming as your as your matter of, uh, of, of, of analysis. And only um, point is that Reinhard Selten got the Nobel Prize in Economics in uh, 1994, and Yuchi Ho never got anything. And uh, this sort of leads me to a little intermezzo, if I may, uh, because it's a bit of a frustration, maybe, for all the people who develop these methodological issues that they not always get the credit for what, for what they develop. Um, another example is that, and I won't talk much about this, but the Stuckelberg equilibrium was the other thing that was put forward in the early 70s by Simon and Kruitz. It has a leader-follower structure, so it's not uh, simultaneous decision-making, but leader-follower 
sequential decision making. And one of the main results that they put forward is that the open loop Stockelberg equilibrium is time inconsistent, which means that the leader strategy, so you announce a strategy over time up to the to time horizon, that it loses the optimality when time passes by, simply because the effect of your future announcements on current actions disappear. And then you change your policy because you can do better. Now, this idea was also picked up by, um, by Tutlet and Prescott in 1979, and they received the Nobel Prize in 2004 for time inconsistency in macroeconomic policy. It was exactly the same thing. And again, Jose Cruz doesn't get anything, right? They, they were much earlier with the same ideas, but they didn't get anything. Okay, after this little bit of a frustration from, uh, from the methodologist, I, um, I will go back and, and discuss with you um, differential games and the way that they are solved. Um, as I said earlier, um, so there's a distinction between the open loop equilibrium and the feedback equilibrium to derive dynamic programming. And there's a counterpart in the techniques that are used to solve optimal control theory. Um, of course, for an opt optimization problem, it doesn't matter which technique you use, right? You just find the solution. But if you do a game, it matters. And I will tell you why. So first, I describe two techniques that are very popular. One is the maximum principle that was put forward by Pontryagin and co-workers in 1962, and that will be used to calculate the open loop equilibrium. You introduce co-states, you do some static optimization. I will tell you soon what it, uh, how it works. And what you get is, in, instead of optimization, you get a dynamical system in two variables, one state and one co-state. And if you can solve that system, you have a the necessary conditions for the for the optimal for optimal dynamical problem. Now, when you have a game, it's not much more complicated because Nash equilibrium just requires the consistency of the optimality conditions of each player. Okay, so you write down the optimality conditions of each player. When they're symmetric, they're all the same, and then you require consistency of all that, and you have a have a have a game solution. So the, that's not the difficult part. Now, dynamic programming goes back to Bellman in 1957. That's the idea of feedback. And it's the idea that you, instead of sort of determining your strategy for the whole time horizon, you observe the state, you decide when you have observed the state. And what that means is that you have to be backwards, you have to work backwards in time. You wait till the final period, and then you see what people will do. And then given that, you will see what they do a bit of time before, et cetera, et cetera, and you unravel the solution. That's the way dynamic programming works, and you can do the same thing in optimal control. You define a value function, which is something like the, the benefits or the cost to go. It's a state function. Again, the state is important. And then you say, how do I influence the state at this point in time? And then you have everything, because you have the, the current optimization plus the effect in the future via that, uh, that value function. And again, if you do that, you can write down the differential equation, the value function it can be a partial differential equation, but under stationarity, you lose the time factor there. And then again, Nash is not important because it's just consistency of the optimality conditions. But the optimal control techniques are the important differences that, uh, that we have to employ. So now I get to, to some substance, okay? Um, the example is this international pollution control. That's the example uh, where Dr. Long put forward the idea that uh, the tassels uh, like so much. So what we have there is uh, a simple problem where there are two countries, both countries produce from level Y. The emissions come from production, but for simplicity, we just equal emissions E equal to Y, and there's stock pollution, okay? So the stock accumulates the emissions. Then there's benefits of production. It's a simple quadratic benefit function. There's damage of pollution. It's stock pollution, and there's a natural assimilation rate, there's a discount rate, and there's symmetry. That's the most simple problem that we have. Um, now, listen, what, what is going on here? Because if you have a dynamical problem and you have emissions in a certain point in time, you add to the stock, then they will stay there for a while, right? So the damage is not only instantaneous, but the damage will also uh, occur in the future until uh, some natural assimilation will have taken away that, uh, that level of emission that you put in at, at that point in time. But it takes a while. And you sort of need what they call, you need a, um, um, a, shadow, a shadow value. And I've written down the, the formulas here. So you sort of introduce a lambda, which is a shadow value of adding something to the stock. 
okay? In the shadow value, we have some forward-looking nature because everything you put in now will have damage in the future. It's sort of a net present value of damages in some sense or another. So there is a dynamical equation describing that uh, the development of the shadow value. Now, then you only locally optimize marginal benefits uh, equal to the, to the shadow cost, so to say. And then you have this stock pollution problem, uh, this stock accumulation problem. So you add two YE, which is YI, that is two EI, the emission level minus the natural assimilation. And this is originally the equation in the shadow value, but you can replace it with an equation in the YI because of this, uh, this linear relationship here. Okay. Um, and employing the maximum principle leading to this set of necessary conditions will give you the open loop solution of the differential game. Everything is symmetric, so the, all these things are the same, so there's only one shadow value that makes things, things easier at this point. Okay, let's see if we can understand how this necessary condition look like. So you have to solve this system of two equations, two dynamical okay. equations. You only have one initial condition. Okay, so you don't have um, um, a unique solution. You have a set of solutions. You have a set of things you can draw in, um, in a graph, right? And so here is, a situa here is the situation described. Uh, these lines here are the steady state lines of these two differential equations. This is the steady state line of the stock equation. This is the steady state line of the shadow value equation or transferred into a steady state line for the, for the control. And I also put in here, without giving the exact formulas, is the one under cooperation. Under cooperation, this one is steeper simply because under cooperation, the countries also take account of the damage they do to other countries. Right, so the marginal damage is not only in their own country; it's also marginal damage to other countries. So that means, if you look at it carefully, and I can understand you don't see it immediately, but I think intuitively, it's quite clear. You get a steeper line here, and then the steady states for the system here is this, uh, the steady state for the open loop system for the open loop solution. Here's the steady state for the cooperative solution, and of course, it's logical that the steady state for cooperative solution is to the left uh, of the open loop solution. Okay, now how do how is this thing now solved? As I said earlier, there's a there's a whole set of trajectories that solve that system because you only have one initial condition. Okay, so there are all sorts of things that go through that area and that that are possible solutions to the system. But the system are only necessary necessary conditions. So what is the one that is optimal? Well, if one goes anywhere to corners or so, it can never be optimal. So the one that is optimal is actually the one that goes to the steady states here to stay there. And the only one that can go to the steady state and stay there is the stable manifold of the, of the two-dimensional system. Okay, if you don't understand what it means, then you just forget about it. You say, okay, I understand now that you have to move to that. But there's a steady state line here, a, a stable line here that you move to that steady state. And the same happens for the cooperative solution. Okay? Having said that, um, Let's go to that other situation where you have the feedback Nash, or as it's now sometimes called the Markov perfect equilibrium. Why is it called Markov perfect equilibrium? Because we use the state concept and we use up in perfectness, right? So if you take everything together, you sort of make it Markov perfect, then everybody understands what you mean. But originally it was called the feedback Nash equilibrium. Now, you have a similar idea. What, what the idea here is that you have a value function that is a function of the state only. The time doesn't play a role because everything is stationary. Okay. Again, there's some form of static optimization because at each point in time, you optimize and you have a local optimization problem plus the effect in the future, and the effect in the future is translated into the value of that value function. So you influence the state, and the state will influence the value in the future. And then again, you have static optimization, and you implement it, and what you have to solve at the end is a... Uh, differential equation in the value function as a function of the state S. Okay, that's the thing that you have to solve. Now, originally, I come very close to where I would like to end with the Dr. Long story. Originally, people thought, like me, that, oh, this is an easy problem because it's a linear quadratic problem. So I don't know what the value function is, but it's probably quadratic. No, this pointer doesn't work anymore. Anyway, the value function is probably quadratic, 
and <laughs> the next slide or the no the pointer oh it works oh okay oh yes okay thank you very much I needed that's your hand for a sec so that's yeah. why <laughs> so if you have quadratic value functions then from this equation, you get linear controls and you can plug it in here and you find the, uh, the coefficients that you need, you have the solution. Okay, so that's originally what, uh, what people like me were doing. And um, then the interesting thing was that um, what came out was that the steady state of that Markov perfect equilibrium is larger than the open loop one. Okay, and so this is important because if we do games, we sort of work in the tradition of the Nash program. John Nash already formulated what we need to find is an equilibrium, and Nash equilibrium comes close to the corporate solution. Because at the end, that's the best we can do. The closer we get, the better we are. So here you find that the Markov perfect equilibrium is not so good, it's not so closer to the, to the corporate solution than the, uh, than the open loop one. And so that looked unfortunate, and this is the, oh, hold on. Okay, yeah, so um, the question then that was asked, and it was actually not asked by Dr. and Long, it was asked by two Japanese, Tutsui and Mino, earlier, applying this on a different differential game. Why do you assume quadratic value functions and linear controls? Can there be other value functions with nonlinear controls? And the answer is yes. And um, the way you can do it, and this is not exactly the way that Tsutsui, Mino, and Dr. Long have done it, but it's the best way, I think, to do it, is you rewrite the helmut jacobi bellman equation, and then you find a um, differential equation here in um, the control as a function of the state. And you solve this, and then you find all sorts of trajectories possible trajectories, possible solutions for the control in terms of the state, and you intersect them with the steady state and you have a solution for the, for the problem. Now, if you do that, um, we find this system here. This is what Dr. Long have been doing. So um, what they found was that this is a possible trajectory and that's a linear one, but this is also a possible trajectory. And this one is tangent to that steady state line, but it still holds. And then the interesting thing is that this solution here is closer to the cooperative one than the open loop one, to the cooperative one than the open loop one and the earlier linear Markov perfect one. So it helps in the Nash program to consider uh, nonlinear equilibria, and that was the result that Dr. Long put forward. And I think that's the reason, Tasra, that you that you enjoyed that paper. Um, but but let me go back a second. What I find personally interesting that um, there's another way to look at this um, because this differential equation of the control in terms of the state can be written as a system of differential equations in that same control and in S, but this S equation is different from the, uh, from the stock pollution equation. Okay, but this system here is equivalent to this um, differential equation that we had here. And this system, we know how to analyze that system because it's very similar to the system that we had before. If this system has a steady state, it is also a steady state in the original system because then um, uh, the, the stock means, means the same thing at that point. Now, if you do that, um, that system has, um, oh, hold on. Here it is. That system has this line and this line the steady state lines. Here, the steady state of the system. The stable line is the linear one, but there are other ones that were not feasible in the original open loop setting because they were not um, intersecting with steady states, but these other ones are intersecting with the steady state. For example, this one is intersecting with the steady state line. So now we find these two marks of perfect equilibria, one, the linear one, and one that's closest to the to corporate steady state. Heavy stuff. I had no other way, right? Because <laughs> I wanted to tell what the idea was, because otherwise uh, I cannot I cannot move forward with the with the whole story. And um, 
So um, we liked that idea, um, Tausus and I, and we also um, got in contact through um, those boat trips with the ecologist uh, who we met in the, um, in, on the island. And one of the ecologists there uh, was Steve Carpenter. And Steve Carpenter was very enthusiastic that he managed to um, um, make models for lakes, eutrophication of lakes, that fit very well with the observations that they made all over the world. And, um, but these were difficult models, were nonlinear models with tipping points. Okay, so because the idea of these tipping points was that what they observed was that the lake would sort of be blue and healthy, and you release phosphor on it, and you release more and more, and doesn't really change. And at some point, you release a little bit more, and suddenly the whole, whole thing shifts into a, to a very dirty green soup without fish and smelling badly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these phenomenon you also see in coral reefs, for example, if you increase the maximum temperature of the sea of the ocean, then the coral reefs break down. And climatologists expect that we will have the similar thing in climate, right? That's why I always talk about this two degree uh, or one and a half degree limits, because they expect if you go a little higher that you will have a dramatic effect. And um, so these models are extremely important for uh, for environmental economics. And um, I think Tassos and I will both argue it's also extremely important to use differential gains because it's it's a, it's a, it's a model with a state namely the stock of pollution in the lake, and you have um, um, common property, right? So you have more people using this. And uh, so we have to try to see if we can solve these models with, um, um, with as a differential game, even though they are nonlinear and have tipping points are very complicated. Now, our first paper that we, uh, that we produced, and this has become a popular paper, Tassel, I think this was one of the five or six that is still highly, uh, highly appreciated. We were able to find open loop Nash equilibria. And the interesting thing was that because of this tipping point, you have good and bad areas in the lake. It's called oligotrophic and eutrophic. And so there was already a multiplicity of open loop Nash equilibria, namely one in the eutrophic area and one in the oligotrophic area. And you could actually be trapped in, the, in one side or the other. If you, were, if you pollute too much, then you stay in the, in the eutrophic area and it's very hard to get back. And um, so, um, but then, of course, we got the idea that let's try the doctor a long idea in this model. And we managed to do that. That was that's complicated stuff. And as I said early in the beginning, I was planning to present this, but I thought then I lose the audience altogether. I may have lost them anyway at some point, but I thought that would be hopeless. But we managed to do it and we managed it to do it uh, with the help of so Karyal Mala was already involved from the beginning. He is the director of the Bayer Institute where we had these meetings and he and Taz and I uh, got together and worked on this problem from the beginning. But we also got help from two um, uh, um, scientists in Crete, uh, George Kosioris and Michael Plexusakis. And um, actually, Phoebe, you said in the beginning you admire Taz so much because he was able to build a career, world, a world career from Greece. I would like to add to that, he was able to build it from Crete. That's even, that's even a strong, even a stronger achievement. That's amazing. But um, but like everywhere, you also have good good researchers on Crete, and and George and Michael were a good uh, computer technology, and and we worked together. For me, this was an excellent situation, right? So working with three Greeks, and then having to decide where to meet, <laughs> and the Greeks would said, "Well, why not come to us? Because the Netherlands is too cold." And I was happy to jump in the airplane and fly to Ghania and, uh, and meet these people. It was a very happy, very lucky and a very, uh, very interesting period altogether. Um, however, Steve Carpenter always argued to us, he said, you're using a too simple version of the model that I presented uh, in, in the 90s about the lake. You at least need also some, what is called some mud equation, that there is some slow dynamics in the lake, in the mud of the lake, that's very essential for the for the physical processes that take place in the lake. So um, Tassos and I um, started to work again. This time we got help from Dieter Gras from, uh, from Vienna. And we managed to find open loop Nash equilibria for the, for the two dimensional model, right? One with the fast dynamics of the phosphor accumulation and one with the slow dynamics that was the recycling process in the, in the mud of the lake. 
And um, so um, it brings me to the end of the story. And um, that's what I cannot end differently than saying, um, we still have one paper to go. So <laughs> you think, one. One. oh, at least that. one. Just You think you can retire, but we still have to do something. The mark, the mark yeah, <laughs> and we have we have already found another uh, computer whiz kid like um, uh, Yang Yang Chai, and he can be able to do something. And um, but this is how I like to, uh, to to finish my story. I'm very sorry, maybe that I may have lost you with some of the technical no, details. No, of the, uh, uh, but but but, but Tassos has done even more complicated stuff, believe me. And uh, so if I would have to reproduce his work, then I would have lost you anyway. Tassos, thanks so much for all the good years and um, and uh, and hope that we can continue to do some work and see each other thank you very much it's always a true joy listening to art he makes things uh, so explicit obvious and simple and uh, we are all grateful that you are here art of course i know that we couldn't you know, we couldn't uh, keep you for, from coming anyway because of how much you did with Tassos. Um, I would like now to ask George, the head of our departments, to say a few words. Good afternoon to all. First of all, thanks for the opportunity to say a few words about Professor Xepapadeas about TASOS. TASOS joined the Department of International and European Economic Studies of the Athens University of Economics and Business in 2007. Since his appointment, TASOS has played a leadership role both in the department and the university as a whole. Specifically, during the period 2010-2013, he served as the chairman of the Department of International and European Economic Studies, whereas in the period 2013-2017, he served as the Dean of the School of Economics. Scientifically, Tassos is a scholar of enormous breadth and technical power, working at the fertile interface between mathematics and economics. His research has left an important internationally recognized footprint especially in the area of environmental economics. Tassos has a widely published scientific work. Particularly, he appears as an author in numerous books, many of which have been published by reputable international publishing houses and in more than 100 publications in top scientific journals. Whereas, his scientific research has received an extremely high number of citations by other researchers. He has been and continues to be a member of the editorial board of numerous prestigious scientific journals, while he has participated in more than 150 international scientific conferences. Moreover, as already said, during his long academic scientific career, Tassos has received many distinctions, among which stand out his election as president of the European Association of Environmental and Resource Economics for the period 2004-2007, and his election in May 2018 as an international member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. In addition to his stellar research accomplishments, he has made outstanding contributions to the department's undergraduate and graduate teaching programs. He has mentored individuals at all levels, has helped through his valuable guidance young scholars, and has supervised many PhD students some of whom are between us in today's event as colleagues. Personally, personally, relatively recently, I had the honor and privilege to collaborate with Tassos in the context of a research project on climate change and monetary policy. During this collaboration, I had the opportunity to see, among other things, his deep commitment to both scientific research and excellence regarding academic standards. Beyond, however, these significant achievements and contributions to the university, Tassos will be remembered most for his warmth, humor, and generous spirit of collegiality and open-mindedness. He was always willing to help 
and support departmental and intra-departmental activities at the levels of the department, the school, and the university. To sum up, TASOS has been and continues to be, with the capacity of emeritus professor, an invaluable asset for both the Department of International and European Economic Studies and the Athens University of Economics and Business as a whole. It is really a great honor for me to serve in the same department as TASOS. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Economides. Thank you so much, uh, George. Indeed, uh, Tassos is, um, is still with us, and the people uh, in Polonia should know that. <laughs> uh, he's uh, very in instrumental in our postgraduate courses as well, and he was uh, instrumental in founding those courses. So. He's very important uh, for us, and he will uh, remain to be. Now, I would like to ask you, George uh, Zanyas, Professor Zanyas, he's the reason that we got Tassos here. Basically, Tassos was happy and productive, and uh, with no intention to leave Crete, and this guy has managed to attract him, so. Thank you, Fivim. That proves I'm a very good negotiator, okay? At least. To say the least. Okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Um, it's uh, really very, very nice talking about uh, TASOS in this event, and I would like to congratulate the department for um, uh, paying tribute to those two colleagues. <clears throat> um, I will start with uh, <clears throat> what Professor Zhu said about um, Tassos uh, developing uh, an, an excellent international career from uh, from university, a regional university like uh, Crete. Uh, I can add uh, a few more things to that. Uh, since uh, I know Tassos, um, because I know Tassos since his academic childhood, if I may say that, uh, being the first um, two faculty members that were elected to the Department of Economics uh, uh, 35 years ago in uh, in Crete and um, in fact we were sharing the same uh, uh, office uh, and um, I went we were elected on the same day but I went there a year later because I had not completed my military service yet at that time we were too young you know we we're even doing military service when we <laughs> first uh, met um, um, and um, um, it's uh, amazing. That was a, a, a new department. Um, there was nothing about economics in uh, the University of Crete at that time. Uh, Tassos ordered the first book in the library, and the second, and the fifth, and the thousandth. And uh, Tassos ordered the first journal in the library. That means totally from scratch. Totally from scratch. There was nothing there. And you know, the internet was not at that time, we're talking about 1987 at that time, you could then get anywhere and uh, download a, a paper. Okay, there was nothing. And in, in the middle of all that, in the middle of the Mediterranean, really, he, he built this uh, career. Uh, I remember <laughs> very characteristic that, um, uh, you know, one day we're sharing um, uh, the same uh, office uh, as I said. And um, he had sent a, a paper uh, for, to the General for Environmental Economics and Management. And uh, he got a response to that. And, you know, very anxious. That was one of his, uh, um, you know, uh, first uh, excellent uh, publications. And uh, I asked him what happened. And he said, yes, I want to review it. They wanted to review it. And uh, is the review, you know, something different cannot do? No, they asked me to split the paper into two papers. So really out of, of one paper, he produced two papers, actually, for that. That was um, uh, <coughs> Tassos. Um, and um, um, the thing is that um, not only he created um, uh, an excellent career in, in Crete, but he, he really created a department. Myself, I stayed there for three years <coughs> only. Um, and um, uh, Tassos created the department. He recruited all the staff, one after uh, the other uh, there. He built the, uh, 
um, you know, everything uh, there. So he's the creator of a, of a department, uh, really. Now, it's, um, uh, as uh, Phoebe uh, said, uh, that um, I was um, in this department, Department of International European Economic Studies. Myself, I'm um, being the chairman of the department, I think it was around uh, 2005. Um, Tassos uh, already had a, an excellent um, CV and um, um, many were trying really to bring him to, to their departments, uh, including the Department of Economics of our uh, uh, school uh, here. So um, I went to Crete um, uh, for uh, two days, maybe uh, one and a half a day and to present the paper, uh, but I went really to get to Tassos. Uh, so uh, I stayed two days there and uh, he said, uh, I will reply to you in a month. And in a month he calls me and he says, I will come to your department in Athens. That was it, really. I was thrilled about that and I, I want to thank him really for saying yes um, uh, at that uh, time. <laughs> Okay, you are welcome to us. And, and uh, I hope he, he didn't uh, regret that, uh, really. But um, now the thing is that apart from uh, his excellent uh, CV and the, <clears throat> and the creation of a, of a new department, uh, he, he contributed, of course, to, to uh, the, the progress of our department here. Because Tasso is not someone who is doing research, 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 research only. He's not someone who is doing teaching, 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 teaching only. He's not one who is doing administration, 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 administration only. He's doing all three. At the same time. At the same time. You know, so he was the chairman of, of the department in, uh, in Crete for, for uh, many years, and he was the chairman here. He was the dean in Crete, he was the dean here. You know, he was involved in, in, in all that. Um, that, so he is a multi-talent um, um, kind of, of a, a person. And um, he built, uh, um, as a Professor Zhu said also, uh, you know, an international career, uh, not only in, um, in, in journals and the pure academic work, uh, you know, uh, he, he became a member of the Academy, of the US Academy. He was, I think, George, I'm not sure whether you mentioned that, he was the chairman of the Ecological Institute of the Swedish Academy. Uh, also, ah, you mentioned, sorry. Yeah. Phoebe, oh, yes, okay. You lost my... Yeah, I lost your presentation. Oh. Yeah, that, <laughs> never do that again. <laughs> so, um, uh, he, he was, and I think he was the only non-Swedish, probably, Tasso, that he chaired this institute. Probably, yeah, or, or, or close to that. Uh, and, of course, the... Um, the um, uh, the European um, uh, association. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was the director. Okay, so uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think there is uh, something more to say about uh, uh, Tassos. Um, I know him uh, 35 uh, uh, years, and um, apart from uh, um, an excellent academic, that you all know that uh, he is, he is also an excellent person and a very good friend. So Tassos will continue being friends. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, George. Uh, Professor Zanyas was also head of our department and he contributed in many different ways uh, in addition to bringing Tassos to us and we are thankful. Tassos has uh, created an ecosystem of amazing scientists. Uh, as a PhD supervisor, as postdoc supervisor, and of course as a, as a teacher, university teacher. Professor Evthymia Kiriakopoulou is one of these uh, very important young scientists that uh, follow, uh, that were born under the supervision of Tassos. And we are all very proud of her. And I leave it to her to give us the storyline of how Tassos affected her work and maybe show some parts of that work. Thank you. Hello, <laughs> thank you so much. Hi from uh, Uppsala. Uh, let me start that it is a great, great honor to be uh, uh, here and present in this uh, event. 
Uh, as probably some of you know, uh, Professor Xepapadeas was my PhD supervisor and he has been my mentor ever since. Uh, and there are really no words to express how lucky uh, I feel uh, that I had and I still have the opportunity to work and uh, interact uh, uh, with him. And actually being in academia for more than a decade now, I have met and interacted with a lot of environmental uh, economists and I can assure that uh, a, a lot of them uh, have, have been inspired by his uh, uh, work. Uh, now, when I asked what I should uh, uh, present today, uh, I was uh, encouraged to present uh, something, something that is strongly uh, inspired by uh, his uh, work. And I said, okay, this is easy because all of my work is inspired uh, uh, by him. He has actually taught me the way of uh, uh, doing uh, research. And uh, maybe now it's time to share my slides, right? I can continue talking about our collaboration, but maybe now I have to show you something called disabled participant screen sharing. I think you have to give me the rights to share my slides. <laughs> Great. Now I think I'm allowed to share my slides. Thank you. So I decided to uh, our some of our joint work actually um, uh, is on the structure of cities and uh, uh, on the internal structure of cities and how they are affected by, produ by production and uh, environmental externalities. So actually, this paper uh, is related uh, to a couple of joint papers that we have. Uh, so let me let me present, have a short presentation, and uh, explain uh, to you how working from home uh, can potentially change the internal structure and the size of the city. So this is our research question in this uh, uh, paper, um, and the idea here is that households and firms decide where to locate in the interior of uh, uh, cities. Uh, taking into account uh, some agglomeration and dispersion forces. However, the pandemic has changed the agglomeration cost and the agglomeration benefits that are associated with these uh, decisions. Uh, and this is because uh, households, uh, not households, workers basically are allowed to work from home, right? So when people work from home, they commute less frequently, so they are less uh, willing to pay uh, highland rents and locate close to the to the central areas, and at the same time they need some home office space, um, which means that they probably uh, will probably want to search for larger apartments or houses uh, with lower rents, even at the suburbs of the city, if not uh, uh, close to the city center. Mm, and now, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, how working from home will uh, look like or will affect us in the post-pandemic era, there is some consensus in, uh, in the scientific literature that working from home is actually going to persist in uh, the post-pandemic uh, era. Uh, there are a lot of large companies that have already, already announced that they are switching to, to long-term uh, remote uh, work, but at the same time, working from home has already changed and is going to, to change even more uh, the demand for housing and office uh, space. So in many big cities that are often very, where the rents are often very expensive, households are searching for more spacious properties like larger apartments or houses uh, outside the big cities, since people do not have to commute. Uh, so often, and a lot of firms are vacating part of their buildings. Uh, the results of this paper, I present them now because I have a very short time, so I'm not sure what I'm able to present. So the results of uh, this uh, paper indicate that working from home facilitates the emergence of monocentric cities. So it is easier to have monocentric cities. To give you an idea, most of the large uh, cities have a monocentric city structure. Uh, 
uh, residential, both residential and business rents fall because of working from home. Uh, working from home benefits workers only in large enough uh, uh, cities. And we finally find that workers have uh, incentives to adopt an efficiently high working from home uh, uh, scheme. So they want to work from home a bit more than what is considered to be uh, the social optimum. Uh, so this, I will not show any equations uh, uh, given the short time, but I can just describe that uh, here we have a linear monocentric city model. Uh, in these uh, models, there are usually uh, two forces that explain uh, the formation of uh, business and residential clusters in the interior of cities. So we have the business production externalities that explain why firms prefer to locate close to other firms as to benefit from knowledge, spillovers, interactions, have access to pool of consumers, labor, and so on. And then there are also the commuting uh, cost of workers, right? That doesn't allow workers to, to locate very far away from their work location. So this is usually the trade-off that we consider in this urban models. Now, working from home adds some uh, extra features in this model, right? So firms save office space, workers commute less frequently, and workers also need a uh, home office uh, space. Uh, I will now show you some graphs instead of equations. Uh, so this graph shows that uh, working from, from home facilitates the emergence of monocentric cities. So here we have uh, uh, no working from home. And as we move towards this direction, we have full working from home, right? And in this axis, you see the population size or the city size, right? Uh, so here you can see that uh, uh, um, when there is no working from home, we have monocentric cities for a smaller uh, uh, for smaller population sizes for for like more uh, restricted uh, set of parameters. And actually, when we allow people to work from home, we can have either smaller or larger cities in uh, equilibrium. Uh, in this graph, we can see the effect of working from home on uh, productivity. Uh, M3 here is uh, a, a lar like a city with uh, a, a, a larger population, right? And here we have a smaller city for M1 uh, or smaller population size. So what we can see here is that when we allow people to work from home, we move from one to, to zero, then there are benefits for larger cities and losses uh, for smaller uh, cities, losses in terms of productivity. This is a graph showing the business land rents and the residential land rents. Uh, when people work from home. The black line here is no work from home and the other lines have a positive fraction of working from home. So here we confirm that uh, um, in the city we have lower land rents, like there is less competition for land. Uh, in this graph here, we can see that uh, uh, for, given, for given population sizes here, workers in equilibrium want to work from home more uh, compared to what is uh, socially uh, optimum, right? Uh, which implies that there is some need for regulation. And then uh, finally, we have calibrated this model and we have calibrated this model for the average European capital city uh, that has a size the, where the population is approximately 3 million and also for the largest European capital city. So this is Paris, right? That has 12 million population in the metropolitan area. So what we can see here is that the utility that is shown by this line, the blue line and aggregate production in, in cities that have this size, like 3 million, uh, there are some losses in, in the utility and aggregate productivity when people work from home more. Remember, this is no work from home and this is 
increasing fraction of working from home, while for some larger cities, uh, utility uh, is increases, right? So people in these cities, um, are uh, there are benefits, it is beneficial for them to work uh, from home. In the next uh, set of graphs, we relax the, the assumptions and we assume that there are some advances in digital technology that allow uh, uh, home officers to be more productive when they work from home, right? And we see that this improves a bit the results even for the smaller uh, cities. So here, uh, the highest utility is uh, uh, close to half, half work from home uh, work at the office. And again, clear benefits for the larger cities. While when there is perfect substitution between home and office work, we can see that there are clear benefits for uh, both uh, city uh, uh, sizes. Now to sum up, uh, this uh, uh, paper showed that uh, there are uh, uh, potential benefits for big cities when, we, uh, when workers are allowed to work from home uh, part of their time. Uh, and potential uh, uh, benefits in terms of uh, productivity. However, uh, given now that there are a lot of collective agreements actually that uh, they're trying to, de to, to, to design a legal framework around working from home, we need to take into account uh, different things. So it's not very, very clear uh, that it is uh, so uh, beneficial, right? To, to work from home, to permanently work from home, especially uh, if we have large fractions of working from home. Uh, the advances though in digital technology could facilitate all these decisions. And uh, the, the main question actually that motivated uh, this paper is if working from home is good uh, for, the, for the environment, right? As an environmental economist, I am interested in this question. So it is clear in general from the literature that there are a lot of environmental benefits in high densely populated, uh, in densely populated areas. So there are a lot of, uh, yeah, it's, it's very, very unclear if working from home will be good for the environment, right? In smaller office spaces might imply energy savings uh, and less frequently commuting, but uh, it's good for the environment, but we potentially might have longer distances per commute in the long run, and then larger houses also imply higher energy use. Okay, I will not take more of uh, your time. That's all for today. Um, enjoy, uh, let me stop share my screen. Enjoy the rest of the uh, session. I would really love to be there with you, and I really hope to meet many of you in uh, real life uh, soon. Thank you, Effie. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Are there any questions? Does anybody want to make a point? I think it would be good to have some quick interaction. Can I ask something? Yes, Given sure. that innovation is, a, is crucial for the energy transition, because this is a technological transition, most of all. Uh, if innovation has some, uh, if the structure of uh, working from home in different cities affects innovation, that would definitely affect the pace of the environmental transition, right? So that could be part of the cost and benefits that you consider with regards to the environmental footprint. Definitely. Now you talk about the innovation in uh, in the tools that allow us to to work from home, or in general on the. No, effect I, of I talk from about home. the innovation that accelerates the uh, the energy transition, ah, like yes. uh, renewables, yes. uh, circular economy, yes. nature based solutions, adaptation projects, and all that. If that has an effect, if yes. the way you work has an effect on that, it will have an effect on the footprint. That yeah, definitely, definitely. This is very, very important when we study different uh, scenarios, right? And this is actually something that we are going to discuss in this project because, uh, yeah, this paper is what I show you today, but uh, uh, we plan actually to use some quantitative urban analysis and analyze uh, 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 what, what are the implications for working from home for, for different Swedish cities. So I would say that for each city and for each country, given the energy mix and all these things, 
we should actually study, you know, <laughs> Uh, what are the implications of, uh, of uh, yeah. Of Excellent, I think you, sh you should know that we are all proud of you, that you finish your PhD here, and at some point we will wait that you will come back when you feel ready. Uh, thank you, thank you. Another very um, prominent new, uh, young scientist who actually won the best paper award in our official journal, IRI, is Fabio Andoniu, another person who finished his PhD here with us at our department and has worked with Tassos and has worked a lot uh, with Professor Haji Panayotu, who is also co-organizing this event. So Fabio, please, the floor is yours. Just uh, wait your hands to tell me that I have to stop at some point. Okay. I think I'm going to be brief. Okay. But, uh, so okay. good afternoon. Uh, I feel privileged that I have the opportunity to talk uh, uh, in front of this audience and, of course, in front of Professor Xepapadeas. He has always been inspiring, an inspiring per person for me. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. And uh, of course, I learned a lot from him. And uh, what I admire uh, on him is that he's always very active. He's still very active. And uh, at the same time, a very humble person. And I think he uh, has been a, a role model for all the younger scientists. Uh, so I've been asked from Phoebe to present something uh, that it, I have been inspired from Professor Xepapadeas. And, uh, I thought that this is a puzzling uh, task to do. And then I took uh, her word literally, and uh, I decided to present something which is a joint work with Panos uh, Hatsipanayotu and Nikos Tsakiris. And actually, it has its deep roots to, uh, it has its deep roots to uh, a question. Probably Professor Xepapadeas does not remember that, but uh, uh, during, during our seminar series, at some point, uh, I, I used to work on strategic trade models, and uh, uh, he had a very nice question. And uh, actually, I worked a lot after that uh, on this issue. And uh, we have an answer after 15 years. Okay, so at least at some point we we arrived there. So the, uh, the his his question was in the strategic trade models. What uh, uh, what is going to happen if uh, we have countries issuing uh, permits unilaterally? And then we allow them to exchange permits. And um, uh, this sound a little, pe a little peculiar uh, to think of why someone should issue permits unilaterally and then accept the permits of the other person. And uh, I, I'm not sure, uh, probably he, he knows that, but uh, it, a lot of papers followed. There are several papers fo following this suggestion uh, in the future and published in very good journals. And uh, they actually do that. So what we wanted to do is to, uh, uh, to adopt this uh, uh, suggestion in uh, the strategic trade, strategic export models with some uh, environmental externality. And uh, I'm going to tell you what these models are. These models are very simple. Uh, Professor Xepapadeas has spent uh, a lot of time on his career in dynamic games, trying to uh, find optimal solutions and trying, trying to find uh, cooperative solutions, probably. And uh, he, of course, studied a lot of dynamic games, but also some static games. And uh, I'm going to talk about static games. And uh, actually, I'm going to talk about the unilateral issuance of tradable permits for, from exporting countries. The idea is very simple. So uh, this is a graph that I would use in, uh, undergraduate, in an undergraduate course. OK, we have, we have some firms residing in an exporting country, several exporting countries. Every country has an incentive to relax environmental policy just to enhance competitiveness uh, uh, of its own firm. OK, so what happens at the end? We end up with uh, uh, too much pollution and too, too, too low profits and welfare uh, is really low uh, because we also have some environmental damage. So uh, what we wanted to do is to, to really uh, build a model following uh, this suggestion. And uh, we have a three-stage game. I'm not going to analyze the game completely. I will just give you the uh, flavor of it. Uh, the governments might, might decide whether to create such a system. Then the governments might decide about the 
uh, of the, the, the number of permits that they're going to issue, and then the firms compete uh, in quantities or in prices, it doesn't really matter in terms of our results. Uh, and uh, actually what we get, at least in the beginning in a symmetric model, that means that all the participants are the same, what we get is that the uh, decentralized solution uh, leads to the cooperative outcome. Okay, I think this, is, this has some value. Uh, I mean, everyone acts unilaterally, at the very end you end up to the cooperative solution. Uh, why this happens? This happens because uh, uh, the abatement cost, the marginal, what we define as marginal abatement cost are equalized because of uh, tradable permits. And uh, that means that the uh, uh, incentive to relax regulation is removed. And at the same time, the incentive uh, to relax regulation in order to attract revenues is removed. So everything happens endogenously and we end up to uh, a cooperative solution and uh, governments have an incentive to participate uh, in such models, in such games. Uh, of course, you might, uh, you might think what happens when we introduce uh, asymmetric countries that are different and uh, here things become more perplexed and uh, we might get to the cooperative outcome again, again acting unilaterally, uh, but we need some sort of indirect transfer. So the governments have to decide about uh, the allocation of revenues uh, across time, uh, across countries. And uh, so there exists, we show that there exists uh, a particular uh, allocation of uh, revenues uh, that can lead to uh, the cooperative outcome. Uh, so uh, basically, that's it, the result. Uh, uh, of course, we discuss many things, we have many extensions, and uh, we go to the details of what this gamma is, what is this optimal distribution. It depends on the characteristic of the countries. So the country that is uh, more environmentally sensitive is gonna, uh, it needs to receive more revenues, and this makes it difficult to participate in such agreements. Or countries that are more technologically advanced and they have uh, lower abatement costs, higher, better technologies, uh, then they, it's easier for them to, uh, th they need to receive, to receive the lion's share of the revenues and it makes it easier to construct agreements, cooperative agreements. Okay, but this is a technical discussion. We have it and I'm happy to discuss it with you uh, if you like. I could say that uh, we can link our results to some, uh, all the results of Professor Xepapadeas. Uh, uh, in the setup, or in a model with Professor Katsulakos, they, in an oligopolistic setup, they end up uh, achieving over internalization uh, uh, of uh, pollution. Uh, we, we find the same thing here in a different setup. Uh, in a very well known paper by uh, Professor Xepapadeas and Art, who is here with us today, uh, they explore the validity uh, of the Porter hypothesis. They find some kind of support, not complete support of the Porter hypothesis, but uh, they show that uh, you can improve competitiveness and uh, uh, somehow we can link the results. It's something completely different. Our story is static, but we can uh, link it with these results as well. And of course he has um, a result, a very well-known result where uh, he shows uh, that you can uh, achieve cooperative uh, outcomes when uh, you allow for some transfers. And we have a similar result. We allow for indirect transfers with different countries and you can get to the cooperative outcome. So that's it. And uh, let me thank you again for uh, all the assistance uh, throughout the years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. Are there any comments? And you notice that it's Professor Perxe Babadeas and Art. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fabio. Um, Thanos Yanagopoulos is one of the best mathematicians in our country. His footprint is definitely beyond Greece. He's an excellent colleague. And I think Dasos is the reason that you are list listed as a social mathematician. <laughs> So I, will, I will drop the mask for Dasus. <laughs> so 
Professor Yanagopoulos is part of the statistics department. And let me also thank you that we have at least 30 people linked uh, virtually to this event. So. So, uh, thank you very much. It's uh, a great honor for me being part of this event. Um, I have to say that uh, I met Tassos uh, quite um, late in my development, uh, I was 40. I met him, I, I really met him because I knew him before, but I really met him and interacted with, with him uh, since uh, 2007 when I joined uh, Athens University of Economics and Business. But I have to say that uh, he did have uh, a deep impact uh, in my research uh, development and um, he gave me the opportunity of um, you know, interacting with uh, an astounding uh, scientist uh, and uh, a wonderful person. So he was uh, very, very open, um, very keen to share ideas and uh, research uh, proposals uh, with me um, and uh, I've had a great time, uh, a very enjoyable and very fruitful time working with him uh, on issues like uh, infinite dimensional uh, dynamical systems in economics or uh, differential games or uh, economics of space and so on. Um, so I'm really grateful for, uh, for having, having me as uh, his, uh, his colleague and collaborator. And uh, I would like uh, today to share with you uh, one of our latest uh, pieces of work, which is uh, related to um, uncertainty, modern uncertainty, and it tries to link uh, decision theory with uh, the theory of optimal transport. Okay, so uh, just as a brief um, introduction on decision under uncertainty, uh, we consider an agent or a group of agents uh, that face uh, a random consequence, lottery, uh, which is to be valued and their n uh, plausible models, uh, probability measures uh, concerning, uh, concerning that. So this is model uncertainty and uh, it's related to what uh, we call in economics and in decision theory and certain version. Now there are uh, various classical choices for a utility function to value x. So this is just an incomplete list. Uh, you can go with uh, min max preferences uh, proposed by Gilboa and Smidler in uh, the 19... Uh, 89, which one could say it's the worst of all possible words, paraphrasing uh, Leibniz. So uh, you take your uh, expectation of uh, an expected utility, and then you go for the worst expectation. So you pick the model that uh, gives you the worst expectation. Then there's the celebrated multiplier preferences by Hansen and Sargent, uh, where uh, you penalize uh, the various models uh, using a penalty function, which is uh, the entropy, the fullback leibler entropy. And then there's a generalization, a famous generalization again by Maccheroni, Marinacci, and Rustichini, uh, which are variational preferences, in which case you generalize the concept of the penalty uh, and uh, you penalize certain, um, uh, certain scenarios, uh, and these are called uh, the multiplier preferences. So, uh, what I would like to share with you today is uh, a suggestion, a recent suggestion in this, uh, in this uh, way of thinking, uh, where you try to take into account that there is some belief in all models, in your, model, in your set of models, each one says a fraction of the truth, and uh, we may treat each model as a random observation of the true model and perform what I say uh, a mean square approximation, but that's in inverted commas, because uh, the space probability measures is not a vector space, uh, so it's a metric space, and uh, there are certain technical complications that uh, go with it. Now, the key uh, quantity in this uh, approach is uh, what we call the Fresse, uh, the Fresse function. So you take the distance of a proposed probability measure from each probability measure, each model in this set of models, and then you weight this distance by some uh, weighting uh, function, by some weight, and you take the probability measure, the model, that gives you the minimum out of all 
out of all that. Okay, so you can define what we call the Fresse, uh, the Fresse multiplier preferences, uh, in which you take uh, the minimum expectation over all probability measures, but weight it with the penalty function, uh, which uh, essentially gives you the variance in probability space uh, measure, in the space of probability measures of uh, your uh, set of models. Now, you can actually prove that uh, if you turn on this parameter theta, which we call the uncertainty aversion parameter, then uh, your utility function uh, will uh, value your, um, your random consequence uh, by something which is less than the expected utility over what we call uh, the body center. And the body center is uh, the, this probability measure, this model that is equally distanced from all the models in the, in the set. Now, here comes uh, optimal transportation. Uh, so we need to metrize the, uh, uh, the spatial probability measures with, uh, a nice, uh, with, with a nice distance. And uh, the Wasserstein distance is a very good uh, way of doing that. So just in a nutshell, uh, the Wasserstein distance is uh, the following. Suppose you have uh, two, uh, two random variables, X and Y. Uh, one is um, distributed by some probability measure P, model P, and Y is distributed by probability measure Q. Now, if you take uh, the joint distribution with X and Y, this is called a transportation plan, and then you take the difference between X and Y squared, and you take the minimum of this expectation, the minimum error you, you will get uh, over all transportation plans. Now, uh, this uh, is uh, essentially quantifying the effects of model misspecification in the sense that if you go for the same random variable, X, and you take an expected utility under the probability measure P and the probability measure Q, then the difference in the utilities, in the expected utilities, is bounded from up and down uh, from this uh, Wasserstein distance. Uh, it's a true metric in the space of probability measures, unlike uh, Kul uh, kullback leibler entropy. It generates a convenient geometry in the space of probability measures, so you can define geodesics or Riemannian structures and so on. And of course, there's a mathematical mythology behind it, uh, starting from Mons, uh, moving to Ampere, Kantorovich, uh, Villani, Figali, uh, in the late years and so on. Now, um, we tried this uh, metrization of the space of uh, probability uh, measures, and we managed to get an explicit expression in terms of the quantile function uh, for, the utility fu uh, for the utility function. I'm not going to get in the into the details, but what is important here is uh, the, the, you can also get uh, a perturbative expansion in powers of 1 over theta, and that leads to an important connection between risk and uncertainty. In particular, it allows you to show that uh, this perturbative expansion gives you sums of expected utilities, but each expected utility comes uh, with uh, an increasing risk, risk aversion. So we think it's a very nice instance of quantifying what risk aversion uh, does, so what uncertainty aversion does with risk aversion. Now, the second thing that uh, we did try was uh, to define marginal uh, ambiguity averse utility, and that's a very simple quantity. Uh, it's just uh, the difference between the, uh, the valuation you would get from this uh, utility functional for X plus Epsilon, where Epsilon is a non-random increase. Uh, and then we also managed to explicitly calculate that, and we get a very interesting result the result is that uh, it's exactly the same result you could get for uh, the uh, marginal utility for, um, uh, for uh, expected utility, but now the probability measure you would use is the probability measure that minimizes this uh, expected uh, utility functional. Uh, and you also can get um, a similar expansion in terms of one, one over theta. Uh, and you get that your marginal utility under uncertainty is always greater or equal than uh, the marginal utility you could get under the barycentric uh, measure, the mean model. Okay, just very briefly a short uh, application. Uh, the application we did try, you don't find many applications, the application we did try was uh, to the social discount rate under uncertainty. So we started by the standard um, 
consumption-based uh, Ramsey discount formula, which I suppose is familiar to all of you. Um, Gaulier used this uh, formula to generate a term structure for, um, for the social discount rate and um, has become a crucial parameter in uh, standard cost-benefit analysis. So our idea was to uh, change this contribution here uh, using the marginal utility under uncertainty as proposed uh, in our model. Now, we managed to get, um, again, uh, a closed form solution for that. And the results go a little bit like that. Uh, well, first of all, you find that uh, the marginal uh, utility is less than the utility you get under the barycentric, uh, the barycentric uh, uh, utility. And uh, you can use the perturbative expansion, uh, the perturbative expansion so that you can analytically approximate uh, the social discount rate using this formula and provide information on the dependence on uh, various uh, parameters of interest, such as theta or uh, the, uh, the risk aversion coefficient. Now, here are some very quick results, uh, just uh, one slide. Uh, we used uh, a model by Gaulier that was uh, parameterized by Bansal and Yaron uh, in, uh, to the US economy data. And uh, this is our results. Um, you get uh, the, individual, the individual term structure uh, curves, which are in blue, under va various possible models for the development of the economy. And the red one is uh, the barycentric uh, term structure. This is the mean model. And then this is what you could get uh, if you have some, uh, uh, if you turn on the uncertainty. And uh, you get that uh, the red line is the barycentric, barycentric uh, model. And the uncertainty averse model gives you the blue line, which is a lower um, value for uh, uh, for the term structure under uncertainty. So I would like to close with uh, a conclusion further plans. Uh, we have only scratched the surface to, of the possibility of using tools from the theory of optimal transportation, in the particular Wasserstein distances in decision theory. And by quantifying the dissimilarity of, uh, between various models in terms of the Wasserstein distance, we propose a class of variational utilities that are suitable for multiple priors amenable to almost closed form solutions which provide interesting insights between risk and uncertainty with interesting applications in uh, environmental uh, economics, risk management and uh, group decision making. So I would like to thank you all, but for, you know, first of all, I would like to thank Tassos for this uh, wonderful interaction throughout this, this year, which I hope will continue. And I would like to thank Phoebe for, uh, you know, letting me be here and for the introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thanos. Indeed, uh, risk and ambiguity are central when we are dealing with environmental problems and uh, increasingly amb ambiguity because we are unaware of the, of the probabilities. So we are facing ambiguity and not the risk or climate variables are highly, uh, climate uh, events are uh, highly uh, ambiguous. Our uh, last speaker of this session is uh, Professor Satsetagis, Eftihis Satsetagis, who is now in Canada. He is a professor at the University of uh, Macedonia in northern Greece, but uh, he uh, he's uh, now spending some time in Canada and he woke up quite early in the morning to be here with us. Eftihis has worked a lot with Tassos, and I leave the Thank you very much. I would like to congratulate the department for setting up this, uh, this event. And I'm really glad that I uh, was given the opportunity to participate, celebrating uh, uh, Tassos' achievements uh, up to this point, uh, definitely not final of his uh, academic career. Um, as already said uh, by many, uh, Tassos uh, not only excelled in um, research, uh, as you've seen uh, with uh, the deep mathematical work that uh, Thanasis presented and other collaborations with uh, mathematicians uh, to uh, policy work, as Professor Zerefos, for example, uh, mentioned. Uh, so Tassus 
was able research wise to uh, connect uh, very theoretical uh, to very policy important issues. And that's a, to me, it's uh, extremely important. Uh, but also, apart from the research uh, contributions, uh, which are very important, as already said, uh, he managed to have uh, important uh, administrative, to start with, uh, contributions. As Professor Zanyas already mentioned, he uh, created from scratch a very, very um, important economics department in Greece, in uh, the University of Crete, uh, that is doing very, very well, which means that he laid very, very strong foundations. Um, and he obviously contributed to your department, uh, which means that not only uh, he, just to say briefly, I don't know how he does that, where he finds the time. Probably he's sitting somewhere, otherwise it wouldn't be possible. Um, now, I'm not prepared. I, I took literally that I would have only six minutes. So I said, it's impossible to present some of our uh, common uh, research work. So I will be very, very brief saying that I met Tassus uh, uh, first time to my first visit to the ERI conference, if I'm not uh, mistaken, in Dublin in 94. And obviously, we are meeting every late June uh, from there on in all the ERI conferences. Um, I had uh, the privilege to work with Tassos uh, in uh, research on a number of uh, policy projects and uh, research projects. Uh, uh, I was invited by him and we worked uh, in the uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in this effort that Professor Zerefos uh, mentioned uh, on climate change impacts on uh, the Greek economy. Uh, more recently, we've done some work for the competition of authorities here in Greece and uh, here, there in Greece and in Denmark, relating uh, to environmental issues and competition issues. Uh, we have published a few, uh, only few papers. Uh, uh, we have but still Tassos will be active. So we have uh, time to publish more. Uh, just to um, make a mention that uh, all the published work has to do, uh, that we've done together, has to do with um, the idea that uh, citizens should get involved into the, I'm trying to find very simple words to describe what we are doing, uh, should get involved into environmental uh, protection. Uh, it should, and that's why one of the policies that we are promoting in this series of papers, we have one should be finishing uh, shortly uh, has to do with uh, policies uh, informing uh, citizens to become more active. Um, I, I won't say anything about uh, research anymore, so uh, we, I can be brief. Uh, I'm uh, completely certain that retirement uh, will only give Tassos more time to do uh, more and more influential uh, research. Apart from all these uh, contributions of Tassos and my academic relationship, research relationship with him, I am very honored to be uh, a friend of Tassos. I have great memories uh, from long discussions on different issues 
uh, great dinners, uh, setting uh, uh, thoughts about economics to politics. Uh, Tassos is a very humble and very, very uh, friendly person. Um, just to finish it up, although we are not very far apart from Tassos, Tassos is only a few years older than me, he has given me uh, great advice over uh, the years, as he did with uh, other younger colleagues, uh, as they already attested. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't follow all of his suggestions, including his suggestion to do uh, to, to invest on dynamics uh, as he did. Um, however, some of his uh, suggestions helped me quite a lot. And for that, I thank him uh, very much. Congratulations, Tassos. The best is yet to come. Uh, I wish I was uh, here with you to go for a drink after, but we will do that uh, most likely Dreaming. Thank you very much. First time I met you, Eftihis, you were working with Tassos in California, Monterrey. Remember that conference? And Tassos no. says, let me introduce you to a younger guy, to a young guy. So I always thought that you're much younger than Tassos. You are not, huh? Okay, uh, now we know. I'm trying to hide it, but I'm not very much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And uh, see you in Rimini. Yeah. Um, this is the end of the, very of the first session. So we have 10 minutes for the coffee break. We are going to steal another 10 to make it a 20 minutes coffee break because the, our second session is from all around the world, uh, very more prominent people from all around the world. And I wouldn't like to delay it. I eat much. So we we should be back at, uh, let's say, 5, 10, 10 minutes past 5, yeah. Can you still hear me? They're delayed 10 minutes. Okay, fine.
Hi there. Is there anybody uh, in the room at the moment? I just want to check if my slides work okay. You mean online? Hello? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Margarita Gattini. Yeah, I, I don't see any slides. Okay, I'm just going to try sharing my screen. Okay. You can see Lucas, by the way. Hello, Lucas. Hi, Ian. I just want to say hello. I'm not in the room, but I'm somewhere in the room, right? <laughs> I will have the same problem as you. Okay, well. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. I'm just going to see if I can get my slides. Yeah, we see your slides now. Okay, I'm just going to, I'm just going to run them and just check. They look okay. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Yeah, it looks good. That's fine. Yeah. Good. And they're sort of paging through. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Perfect. That's great. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. And now that he's done that, can I do that as well? Hello. I want to do it right. So let's see. Yeah. Who's yeah. next? Um, wait a minute. I don't see this choice yet. I do this. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay, then I can stop. Yeah. Yeah. You see that? Uh, this. This is mine. Okay. Very good. It's fine. It's fine. So everybody has the right to share. That's good.
Τάσο μου έχει μπει. Έχει μπει. Ωραία. So I think we better start so that we don't uh, keep our esteemed speakers waiting. Um, the, the first keynote is by Professor Eletra Alcardi. Uh, she comes uh, from the Department of Economics of the University of Polonia, where Tassos has a part-time affiliation. Eletra is again a prominent member of our world ecosystem of environmental economies, has done very influential work on climate finance and the economics of climate change. I read her work with great uh, care and attention, and I learned a lot from her. Electra, we are really honored that you make the trip, that you are here to talk about Tassos. Please be here. I will do it in that way, no worry, it's fine. Okay, no, it's okay. No. Well, thank you very much, Phoebe, for your very kind and beautiful presentation. Of course, it's a great honor and a pleasure to have the privilege of being here this afternoon for this event in honor of Professor Anastasios Kizepapadeas. I have uh, known him uh, for more than a decade, also because he's very active uh, and in conferences and uh, workshops worldwide. And now I have the privilege of uh, being a colleague of his uh, at the Department of Economics at the University of Bologna, where we could uh, appreciate uh, his devotion to the profession, his passion in uh, disseminating his knowledge, his amiable character, and human qualities. Uh, let me <laughs> just emphasize that there has been a long time tradition of relationships between uh, Greek civilization or Greek philosophy and Italian philosophy. And we all admired this beautiful painting by Raphael, uh, we are admired at the Distanza della Signatura in the Vatican. It was painted in 1509-1511, and it reproduced and interprets philosophy, and in particular, the relationship between Greek philosophy and Italian philosophy. And uh, we all know that uh, there is Plato, whose arm is lifted uh, to the heaven, meaning the world of ideas, theory, and Aristotle, who is to his left, where the palm of his hand is leaning down to the empirical work, uh, to nature and the environment. And uh, let me say that Tazo's work combines, as most of the eminent speakers already said this afternoon, 
combines uh, the most refined uh, and advanced uh, theoretical research with uh, the awareness of uh, the topical economic issues, in particular of nature, environment, climate change, and so on. And uh, this painting is called the School of Athens, as we all know. And uh, in a sense, uh, uh, from the School of Athens, Tasos created the School of Environmental Economics at Unibo, in, where school has not to be considered uh, in the bureaucratic or administrative uh, term, but uh, in terms of, uh, as Phoebe said, uh, the ecosystem, the network, the group of economists working in environmental economics, because uh, it actually attracted many junior researchers also from abroad, and also among senior researchers who probably were more devoted to other topics, industrial organization, finance, and also other, other topics, uh, became more interested uh, in environmental economics and climate change. So we have a bunch of more than 10 researchers working on these issues at the University of Bologna. And uh, here you have uh, some appraisal of Tazo's work from Italian newspapers. And uh, it also helped us uh, in organizing workshops, attracting also other eminent uh, economists. And uh, here, for example, we have a picture from the first workshop on the economics of climate change and sustainability. And we can actually see some of the people who are here joining us this afternoon, Art, <coughs> Lucas, and others. Uh, the uh, paper I'm going to present this afternoon uh, is part of a very recent uh, research project that we started thinking of. And uh, uh, in a sense, uh, it is part of a broader project, uh, which uh, has, uh, led to a um, research proposal also in conjunction with uh, the University of Rome, and it deals with the economics of biodiversity. So the papers uh, that, uh, of course, uh, uh, are uh, the one I wanted to refer to are uh, the one you can see there listed by Brock Papadeas, uh, Levin Papadeas, and they also are in the session this afternoon. And in particular, uh, uh, the, the problem uh, that I wanted to discuss uh, has to do with the uncertainty, uh, the role of uncertainty once we have to value biodiversity, in particular biodiversity management under conditions of uncertainty. And of course, we are all aware of the fact that biodiversity loss and deprivation is a great challenge and of course one of the biggest uh, question uh, that the society is posing these days. But at the same time, uh, I also was, uh, uh, I mean, affected by curiosity from uh, a course that uh, Tazos is giving to the master's degree on the economics of biodiversity, which is unique uh, at master levels in the Italian economic departments. And uh, at the same time, uh, in the back of our mind, uh, there is also uh, the, um, the work provided by Tazos on uncertainty, on ambiguity, which has been also discussed uh, by the previous speaker. And uh, in particular, the work on ambiguity uh, not only extends the notion of uncertainty, and in particular, it provides uh, a new branch in applications of economic decision in particular environmental issues, but in particular once dealing with the very complex issues such as climate change and also biodiversity and also other important issues within the environmental economics, it adds to the analysis because we, are, we have to consider uncertainty over the nature of uncertainty. And uh, uh, this, of course, leads also to a new way that has been uh, uh, developed by Tazo's work in integrating this uh, study of uh, uncertainty over the nature of uncertainty 
it has to be integrated also in uh, uh, policy, in the evaluation of uh, policy making. And here I'm just mentioning uh, and listing some of them. And in particular, I, I do want also to uh, mention uh, a paper uh, that I have uh, with the thousands, which has just come out uh, in the journal Economic Dynamic and Control, which is exactly um, uh, methods of uh, uh, robust control and deep uncertainty in uh, uh, the issue of and the complexity of climate change. So at the back of our mind, there is both the idea of valuing biodiversity uh, from an economic perspective, and in particular considering uncertainty. So in particular, uh, I'm going to evaluate biodiversity as a stochastic process, but uh, we have also to deal with uh, the issue of ambiguity. So let's say that the topic I'm going to discuss this afternoon is the economic value biodiversity preservation. And of course, uh, uh, what uh, I'm going to, to focus on is the economic value of biodiversity. We know that uh, uh, social uh, natural resources have uh, both uh, a use value, an option value, and a an, um, non-use value or intrinsic value. And the value of biodiversity derives, of course, from the value of final goods and services it produces. And of course, this depends on the, the types of species that the ecosystem contains. It depends on substitutability or complementarity. It differs uh, depending on the geographical location, income, scientific development, and so on, spiritual and cultural perception. And uh, we also know that uh, higher levels of biodiversity are associated with enhanced ecosystem stability and resilience. But the kind of analysis that I'm going to pursue here is that biodiversity is also associated with numerous economic benefits. And this is basically what Brockings and the Papadeas showed in terms of the value of the characteristics and services that the ecosystem provides when optimally managed. Uh, of course, in terms of references, I have to start with monumental work, uh, the Desgupta Review, and many papers that uh, Professor Desgupta uh, produced over the years on this topic. And here I mentioned others, so some of them are also listed here. And of course, uh, uh, I'm going to skip them because most of these authors are in the audience this afternoon. Okay, so. Uh, what is the problem here? Uh, first of all, uh, I start with the, the uh, problem from the point of view of a decision maker. The decision maker can be an investor, a producer that has to decide the optimal management of species in the sense that uh, uh, he or she has to decide whether to invest and uh, grow in one particular species, but given that it has a pool of species may actually uh, decide to preserve the others and uh, in particular exploit uh, maybe the most uh, valuable species but then keep the other species there for future opportunities because as we said uh, they can be also used in terms of uh, strengthening uh, 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 strengthening uh, for example resilience stability and so on uh, just very briefly, the value of a species is uh, specified in terms of uh, Brownian motion. So W stands for Brownian processes. And uh, uh, since we have more species, uh, uh, in particular in, in this presentation, I'm just to focus on two species to make things simple. Rho denotes the correlation between the two Brownian processes. And then we assume that the cost of maintaining species is proportional, and there is also a fixed cost, which could be thought of in terms of the cost of acquiring farming to a standard plantation. So the problem is to uh, study the optimal decision between, as I said, either conserving and exploiting only one species, species I, and his the cumulated expected return, or grow many species, and this is the issue of biodiversity preservation, exploiting the most valuable species keep these species for future opportunities just uh, to uh, let's uh, just to provide some example in the case of two species 
uh, just to mention that in Italy we have about 58,000 animal species and over 6,700 plants. Here I have some examples of probably subspecies, not really species. You have French beans to uh, the left, uh, which are very common eaten everywhere, and above grisotti, which is a, a very tasty variety, and it is considered for a niche market. Uh, very rare in terms of production. Then uh, the other picture is apples. Below you have Stark apples. The name comes uh, from uh, the American variety, which was uh, developed by Joe uh, Stark, and this is the name. Uh, we, this is very common. Above uh, we have, uh, for example, Melanurka, which is produced in Campania and it is uh, uh, produced for its nutrients and its healthy qualities but again this is very uh, uh, limited uh, uh, development and then i have the example of pierce uh, below we have a uh, pierce william and above uh, and again these are very common and above we have what we call uh, uh, peravolpina which is neglected fruit or if you want forgotten fruit so these are uh, essentially a wild species that, however, uh, in particular in terms of safeguard of the biodiversity, uh, there is a, 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 the initiative in order to produce them more for cultural heritage, because these are very specific of some location, and this is related to the non-intrinsic value I was mentioning before. Okay, let's just uh, go in very quickly. Uh, um, of course, we can write down uh, the, of course, I'm, I'm skipping the math for this, but uh, uh, let's say that uh, whenever we have a, the region where, the, in the case of two species, V1 is bigger than or equal to V2, of course, that the max is V1. In the other case, if we have the region where V1 is less than or equal to V2, the max is V2. Along uh, the case, when, for the region where V1 equals V2, uh, we have a difference and we can apply the usual uh, value matching and smooth busting condition. And uh, again, we apply smooth busting uh, conditions in order to uh, have uh, the regions where one species is abandoned uh, or both the species are there. So just to be brief, of course, uh, uh, one, uh, we can show that uh, the regions where one species is abound is of the form V2 equals Z star V1 for abandoning species 2 and VT is equal to Z tap V1 for abandoning species 1. And uh, the two uh, thresholds are computed dissolving the system below. Uh, this allows us uh, to uh, perform a little bit of sensibility analysis, but we have some results which are in a sense intuitive. Uh, in particular, uh, we can see the role of uh, correlation. For example, uh, if uh, correlation is negative, which is the second picture, you can show that uh, the cone for biodiversity preservation enlarges. And this makes sense because if uh, rho is less than zero, it acts like an insurance way in the sense that if one species was the one which had the highest value um, upon uh, shocks, negative shocks, it may be likely that also the other species could become the dominant one. So it enlarges the cone where both the species are present. While, of course, if rho is positive, if one species has the highest dominant value, then that value becomes uh, uh, remains probably a dominant again. And then we can do also a little bit of uh, uh, sensitivity analysis with the other parameters, for example, the growth weight of one species, uh, the cost and so on, I can skip this part. But what is remarkable is that, uh, of course, in the presence of uncertainty, where here I denote uncertainty in the sense of uh, uh, sigma, that is to say, uh, the volatility. So here we have uh, 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 quantifiable uncertainty. We have uh, that the cone of uh, preservation of species preservations enlarges. And this is an important result. That is to say, once we have uncertainty, uh, the uh, part, the, the area where biodiversity preserves it, it increases. But then uh, 
uh, what I wanted to do is also to introduce ambiguity. <coughs> and uh, ambiguity meaning that now we have uh, not only to take into account uh, the actual stochastic pro process, but uh, the distortion which can be determined on the stochastic process because, uh, uh, for example, we have uh, ambiguity aversion beliefs. Uh, again, I'm skipping uh, this part, uh, the technicality of this. Uh, let's say that for our purposes, we can use uh, a parameter C, which is a proxy for decision makers' attitude towards ambiguity, since it is uh, the distorted uh, stochastic process which becomes important for decision making. Then we have to study the distorted uh, uh, stochastic process, and in particular, we can see that uh, uh, for C between uh, uh, zero and uh, zero point five, uh, we have ambiguity version. Ambiguity version, actually, as was said. Uh, uh, before uh, puts a lot of weight on the worst case scenario. While in this parameterization, C equals to 0 0.5 is the absence of ambiguity. So uh, we can study what happens to the corner biodiversity. Uh, the introduction of ambiguity dramatically shrinks the scope for preserving both species. Uh, I have an example where I have perfectly correlated linear processes, and here in this example, sigma one is bigger than sigma two, and the other parameters are the same. What we can see is that the, uh, and actually we can compute uh, the percentage of reduction of the cone of a preservation of species, uh, which uh, is due to the presence of ambiguity aversion. So ambiguity and calculated risk seem to work in opposite direction. Then we can do also things in a better way because uh, since we have uh, uh, here, it's a little bit more complicated because we have uh, a multidimensional stochastic process. So we have uh, to study also what happens in terms of uh, the interaction of ambiguity with correlation. Still, uh, we can, have, for example, in this picture where there are independent linear processes and symmetric parameters, ambiguity, again, even though uh, we have the interaction with correlation, we can show so that um, uh, upon ambiguity, the cone for preservation, for biodiversity preservation receives. So it is confirmed that in general, ambiguity works in an opposite direction to uh, the uh, uh, case of calculated risk. Finally, uh, uh, now we have dealt until now with uh, the use value of the species. But then uh, we want also to take into account that uh, we want also to consider the total value of species, that is to say also consider the intrinsic value of species or the non-use value of social importance. As we said, it could be uh, for different reasons, it could be also for ethical reasons, for healthy reasons. So, uh, I mean, I mentioned some of them in the examples of it. And uh, so the idea is to have an ecosystem planner, or as Brock and Sepapadea say, a landscape planner, ecosystem planner, and uh, try to understand the main consideration in terms of the total value of species. So the idea to introduce this is uh, through an harvesting rule. And this is taken from Proclix and Papadosa. So the idea is that uh, this is very simple. We introduce H as a proportion of the biomass of the ice species, which is harvested. And the idea, therefore, is that the social planner, in a sense, requires uh, just to invest a given proportion on one species, leaving the other uh, mass and non-harvested and the producer however receive a compensation for growing the non-harvested mass for example in a, this is simple model it is just a huge subsidy but you can think of other forms of compensation and actually one can show in the model that the total value achieved by the landscape planner reaches its peak in the central region where both species are preserved of course giving more a uh, reason for uh, the need of pursuing let's say also what we could think of in terms of a general public uh, expectation in terms of biodiversity preservation. Okay, uh, very quickly, uh, let's consider the case where the planner's policy is applied only to species one, just for simplicity's sake, and I put 90% uh, the percentage uh, of our harvesting rule, and then uh, several subsidies, probably you cannot see, but uh, this is uh, just a simulation with a different uh, uh, subsidies. 
And uh, for a comparison, when H is equal to one and there is no subsidy, so in, in the basic case, uh, the area of the extinction of a species one was 31% uh, of all possible states. Here we can show that, of course, if I introduce H equal to 90%, of course, uh, the area where uh, species one uh, become extinct becomes larger. It's above more or less 40%. Of course, uh, this area is reduced if I introduce uh, uh, subsidies, in particular, for example, once I have 20% uh, in subsidies, I have 17%, uh, and this is a little bit below 12% when I have 25%. Uh, so, of course, I'm expecting that if I have subsidies, of course, the area where uh, species are re is reduced, where there is extinction. But now the important thing is to see how ambiguity interplays with this, because uh, if we do again uh, this exercise introducing ambiguity, for example, using different uh, uh, parameters uh, of our proxy for ambiguity version, we have that ambiguity offsets uh, the subsidy policy. In particular, for example, take a C equal to 0 0.4, a subsidy 20% basically reduces the likelihood of eliminating species zoom only of a almost negligible amount to 2.4%. And if I increase the subsidy, it's 6%, but it is very little. So in general, what I want to say is that perceived ambiguity has a disruptive effect on the policy and expenditure of the ecosystem planners. So no matter what subsidies are, if there is ambiguity, the effect of subsidy would be neglected. And this allows me to reach the conclusion. Uh, of course, what this uh, paper showed is that calculated risk creates a scope of biodiversity preservation. And of course, the availability of different species provides flexibility in case, of, for example, of consumer shifts in tastes and habits and increases resilience to negative externalities and so on. But then ambiguity may have actually has a deterring influence on biodiversity development and a successful safeguard plan should remove ambiguity. So that was also uh, indicated by the paper by uh, uh, the Papadeos and Levine, avoiding abrupt changes in policy measures, in particular lack of clear and prioritized objective, and in particular in terms of increasing transparency in the development and monetary processes. So we need uh, to improve uh, and remove ambiguity if we want uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, there is a, a successful, safer plan. And it is not sufficient just to uh, uh, use subsidies and public finances if uh, we do not uh, take care of ambiguity. And in particular, what uh, the last part of the paper uh, showed is that a two-tier policy with respect to investment and conservation can actually be developed. One policy tire would target the investor and the investment produ and production policies. It is basically the, the H1 part, so the harvesting part. But uh, the other policy tire would target, let's say, public policy expectations, which means uh, that uh, uh, the conservation efforts, which may might be in finance to public subsidies without any specific, uh, uh, let's say, obligation regarding the economic viability. So in order to keep together both uh, the use value, of course, the option value, which is behind uh, this analysis, and the non-use value. Uh, OK, I, I just stopped here. I said it is part of a project, and hopefully this project might, uh, uh, might produce uh, further further work is it already published this one? no 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 it is so are you submitting it to the very special issue it would be well. very interesting <laughs> I, I wanted to ask uh, um, the the spatial aspects of the biodiversity level do you consider of including them because it, it, they well, might affect especially if you're working with tassos well, uh, um, if uh, if there is a possibility of a co-authorship, why not? Because, of course, the space uh, is an important... I totally agree with you that space is an important issue. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I've never worked uh, with the, mm. the space variable until now, but... Yeah, Maybe. yeah, and uh, yes, and it affects a lot the policy instrument. Uh, and this, uh, yeah, excellent, very, very interesting paper, Electra. Thank you so much uh, for being here with us. Uh,
Okay, the next speaker is one of the greatest economists of our times. This is Partha Dasgupta, Sir Partha Dasgupta. He's the person that inspired me to become an environmental economist as my professor at Cambridge University. He's an amazing personality that helped a lot the European Association of Environmental Resource Economists. He was one of the presidents, but he has been an inspiration to all of us continuously and supported all of us uh, with uh, amazing generosity that I've, I've never experienced anywhere else. So uh, because Partha is a great person, he was able to identify the talent of Tassos very early on. So I will stop talking and leave the... Thank you so much for inviting me. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to see you, even though, I mean, not this real. Uh, uh, through the internet and lovely to feel that my old friends are all together here to celebrate Tassos. And I call him Aristotle. I don't call him Tassos. I've called him Aristotle since probably within a week of my meeting him because I felt there was a, an inquisitiveness, a curiosity of mind, which to me, when I first met him, I think it was 1991 or so which was um, exceptional. Generosity, yes, that's visible, but intellectual curiosity, trying out ideas for size, whether or not, not knowing in advance whether they will gel, was something that was noticeable. And I want to share with you the, the zing that uh, he introduced into a group that met rather regularly at the Bayer Institute in Stockholm. Uh, of which half would be, almost half would be econ economist, and gradually more and more ecologists came in to, to join. And in a way, I like to think that ecological economics was invented in its modern garb. It was invented at the Bayer Institute, and of which uh, uh, Tassos was, uh, Aristotle was uh, more, more than prominent. The real leadership, of course, came from Kaliran, the late Kaliran Mailer, uh, whom we all miss and who would have been, you know, would have been absolutely wonderful if he had been here now. And then he would have regaled us with stories of Tassos's doings and doings, but he's not here. Okay. Um, the, the, the thing that Tassos introduced into our deliberations right from the beginning was rigor. Uh, it's very hard to now imagine what it was like in 1991 when ecologists and economists met. I remember Gardner Brown, the late Gardner Brown, pointed out that there was an enormous amount of suspicion uh, in the atmosphere amongst the groups, two groups, one of whom on the whole, of course, exceptions such as Simon Levin goes without saying, but on the whole, they were empiricists, empirical economists, not uh, ec ecologists, and they were not uh, wedded to the kind of theorizing or mathematical modeling that the economist counterparts brought with them. It took some time to get together. And I think Tassos was absolutely a leader in that. He just did it with, with grace, uh, with enormous attention to detail, and then also explaining why theoretical reasoning was essential, absolutely essential for ecological, socio-ecological systems. Today, we take it for granted, as we saw uh, in this absolutely brilliant uh, presentation by Letra of an extremely technical and extremely interesting problem, uh, which he has analyzed. We take it for granted that that's the standard we expect. We don't often get it. This was an exception, but we expect it. And I like to think that um, Tassos was as responsible as any and more than most of us. Uh, in bringing that to fruition. He has been the guiding light. We have been inspired by him. Uh, what, more, what more can I say? He's altogether good news. Thank you very much.
for uh, communicating here in, in Greece what DASOS is in the international arena of environmental economics and in this a huge effort of interdisciplinary work with, between ecologists and economists. And the next speaker is indeed from the other side of the river, let's say, uh, an ecologist uh, uh, from the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Princeton uh, University, the director of the Center for Biocomplexity, and uh, a renowned scientist that uh, has been working with Tassos the last few years. We are extremely honored that you have the time to talk to us. Please, the floor is yours. Simon Levy. Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me? Is my, is my microphone working? We can hear you perfectly. All right. Well, it's a, a delight to be here to uh, honor Tassos and to follow my, my uh, other good friend, Partha Dasgupta. Um, I, I've been fortunate over the last 30 years to be part of the Bayer Institute that Partha just uh, told us about, and especially the so-called ASCO meetings where you see um, many uh, well-known people here. And there's um, Tassos's picture. I hope you could see it um, clearly. I'm somewhere in that picture. Kenneth Arrow is in that picture. Um, Partha, you are not, you were not at this meeting. Uh, it was at one of those meetings, actually not at ASCO, that Tassos and I first started talking about biological pattern formation and how theories there might be relevant to economics. In particular, the problem of pattern formation is fundamental in biology, all the way from developmental biology to uh, ecosystems. Endogenous pattern formation in development was a side interest of uh, Alan Turing's, the famous computer scientist uh, known for, uh, to most of you for other things, but he was interested in how organisms would develop without an explicit blueprint, how they would self-organize. And he posited that it worked because there were two kinds of interacting chemicals that he called morphogens um, in a homogeneous space, one an activator and the other the in inhibitor, the activator stimulating the production of both species, the inhibitor damping down both, and they diffused at uh, different rates with the inhibitor diffusing at a higher rate. And what would happen then is that what would otherwise be a stable equilibrium between activator and inhibitor would break down because the inhibitor would keep diffusing away from where it was needed to damp the activator. That would break symmetry. The inhibitor was also other places where it didn't need to be, and it damped down the activator. Symmetry could break, and you could begin to get patterns of this sort. You would start with a uniform distribution, some uh, initial perturbation um, that would break symmetry, and that would ultimately lead to pattern as long as the ratio of the diffusion coefficients was high, than, high enough. The way this is described is that pattern arises from a balance between short-range activation and long range inhibition. Well, Tassos and I became very interested in seeing what that might tell us about spatial patterns, for example, in income distribution uh, in economics systems. Uh, and we were motivated in part by one of the first ASCO papers uh, in which um, Partha and I are both authors, uh, which started from the inverted Kuznets curve, suggesting that um, the pollution actually increased with per capita income up to a point and then began to decrease. And our explanation in part for it was the, <clears throat> twofold, but it was that in wealthy countries, um, one turned to banking and things that were less polluting, but also exported pollution uh, in a sense to other countries by funding activities there. Uh, and so Tassos and I set out to examine this, and we wrote a paper uh, in, a, in one of the leading mathematics journals um, in which we considered the spatial distribution between two patches. We did this in discrete space rather than continuous space. So two countries, one of them a wealthy country, one of them a poorer country, but 
They became this way because of an instability. So we looked at stock, the stock flow of capital between the two regions and the stock flow of the pollutant. These are just discrete versions of, of those diffusion equations that you saw before. And ultimately, indeed, we saw that uh, inequality could arise with capital concentrated in the rich countries and pollution in the poor countries. And this was an entirely endogenous process. More recently, Tassos and I uh, have put together many of the discussions we and others, including Partha, have had at ASCO over the years, write a paper that came out recently, uh, last year actually, in the annual review of resource economics on the similarities between economic and ecological systems and indeed on their co-evolution, building in large part on a paper that Kenneth Arrow and Paul Ehrlich and I wrote uh, some years before um, in a volume in honor of Partha. Um, so best wishes, Tassos. I'm really honored to be here, and I hope we'll get the opportunity to write a lot more papers together. I can stop sharing. I'm done. Indeed, everybody is looking um, uh, into a continuation of your work. Tassos, I think you will have more work now that you are uh, retiring from Athens than before, <laughs> which is uh, amazing and valuable for all of us that learn from you. The next uh, speaker is Professor William Brock, uh, an excellent mathematical economist with very important earth and contributions, some of them written with Tassos, a very big footprint in uh, the economic uh, literature and in the uh, specifically in the dynamics uh, um, aspects of it, uh, trying to translate chaos theory in economic modeling and econometrics. So, uh, Professor Brock, the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me to this really exciting conference. It's really quite amazing the amount of ideas uh, that have been put forth in this conference and the amount of ideas that Tassos has stimulated. I first met Tassos in Zimbabwe, of all places, many years ago uh, during a, a combined uh, Bayer and uh, ecological group meeting. And I also met Carpenter there, the lake guy. And uh, both of us started work in Zimbabwe on a whole class of these uh, combined economic and ecological problems. So I'll just, uh, uh, other speakers have already covered uh, quite a bit of uh, Tasso's work, uh, which is mammoth to say the least. So, uh, uh, Electra, for example, uh, talked about the work that uh, Tassos had stimulated me to collaborate with him, where he'd come up with the idea of unifying economics with the work of uh, David Tillman, the great ecologist. And uh, the interesting aspect of that is, is that there's a paper that we wrote together called uh, Optimal Management in Tillmania something like that. And uh, Electra already uh, touched on, on that in her talk. And, uh, and then uh, uh, Tasso stimulated me to get involved with him in a paper that ultimately ended up in the uh, AER, which was an uh, optimal approach to uh, maintaining and fighting resistance uh, which actually originated in a problem in agricultural economics, uh, stimulated by Monsanto of all places, where they had uh, come up with uh, BT corn and they were encouraging farmers to set aside a fraction of, uh, of their fields into non-BT corn in order to prevent resistance. Uh, to the European corn borer, which it was supposed to kill off from building up. And so that Tasso stimulated uh, uh, the development of a beautiful framework, 
which I basically just uh, uh, helped out on. And that uh, ultimately appeared in the AER. And in uh, the US, there's way too much emphasis on getting articles into the top five journals. In fact, uh, some prominent Nobel laureates were actually on a panel uh, that was entitled The Curse of the Top Five. So I hope this doesn't invade Europe because it, it really is a problem here in the US and career building, especially for younger economists. Well, after that uh, little sermon, uh, let me get into some uh, substance. Uh, uh, it has already been mentioned, the work of Hansen and Sargent and their trinity of uncertainties, which include risk, ambiguity, aversion, and misspecification concern. And, and what these uh, extra two uncertainties besides risk pile on uh, is uh, special attention to uh, uh, bad scenarios turning up and how do you hedge against them? Well, Tassos and I uh, got involved in, uh, in pushing the idea of the importance of uh, heat trans transport from the uh, low latitudes uh, around the equator to the high latitudes. What would happen if that mechanism broke down for some reason, perhaps by uh, human influence affecting, uh, for example, the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridial Overturning Circulation and other mechanisms? Well, the tropics are already hot. So who are they going to learn from? Uh, there's nobody to learn from because they already are hot, how to deal with it. Well, if the heat transport mechanism broke down, the tropics would get hotter and uh, Europe would get colder. Uh, so what kind of a damage situation would be added in the usual, say, Nordhaus type approaches when you take this mechanism into account? And what would uh, the biases be if you ignored it, like most of the climate economics literature does. Well, this was an idea of Tassos, and he said, you know, this could be really important. So another paper that uh, uh, Tassos stimulated was with an excellent computational economist named Yong Yang Kai, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, a paper with Tassos and myself, where we asked several questions. Uh, the first is in a traditional uh, standard uh, climate economics model for optimal management of climate, what would happen if, uh, A, there were no uh, compensatory transfers, unlike a lot of the literature on optimal management of uh, the climate system in climate economics, where there are compensatory transfers. Well, I'm, I live in a country where uh, compensatory transfers to the rest of the world seem rare indeed. And uh, a lot of sovereigns tend to be rather selfish about helping out other sovereigns. So what would happen if there were no compensatory transfers at all and the heat trans uh, port mechanism broke down? What kinds of biases would this introduce in, uh, and uh, which uh, would apply to uh, needed correction and standard climate economic analysis and optimization scenarios. And the first thing is, is that for the tropics, under no, trans, uh, under no heat transport mechanism toward the poles, uh, the tropics would be hotter yet, but there's no compensatory transfers allowed in, in uh, the uh, Kai uh, Zapapadeus and myself setup. So the marginal utility of an additional uh, dollar of compensatory transfer starting, starting from a base of zero would be extremely high indeed. And so this is just a bit of a sample of uh, some of the many papers that Tassos has stimulated me to work with on him. And you can see the list of them on his CV. So I'll just close by saying that meeting Tassos 
and Carpenter and being involved with the Bayer Institute that, that uh, Partha already mentioned and Simon has alluded to changed my life. It's been a marvelous opportunity. So Tassos, I hope we can keep working together for a long time. Thank you so much. To get William Brock to say that uh, something changed his life, I think that's uh, that's huge, and uh, that's uh, a really, uh, really uh, important that we are able to uh, have Tassos in Greece and inspire this uh, academic community that needs inspiration and uh, basically um, um, its survival is dependent on people like Tassos who can bring this inspiration at a world-class level. Thank you very much, Professor William uh, Brock. Our next speaker is uh, Lucas Brezke, the fifth, I, I counted five ERI presidents in this event. People would think that we get together and we call ourselves uh, presidents, <laughs> but uh, it, it's a very big uh, association. It's the biggest one with environmental economies with members from 85 different countries, more than 1,500 members. So um, uh, this uh, tells you of the, of the footprint that somebody needs to have in order to lead this association. And Lucas has this few footprint, full professor at the Department of Management, Technology, Economics at ETH uh, Zurich. Um, and uh, Lucas has worked on dynamics of natural resource use, climate economics and policy, energy economics and quantitative modeling, and many um, uh, areas that have uh, uh, similarities and synergies with the areas that Tassos works, and he has also joined work with Tassos. So, Lucas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. I hope you can see me. Yes, I can see it by <laughs> the screen that I'm there and the slides are there. So good afternoon. Thank you very much, Phoebe. Thank you for inviting me. I'm honored to be part of the speakers among these speakers famous uh, group. And I'm also, of course, uh, very happy to say some personal words to Tazos. We have, of course, uh, well, we have uh, ongoing work, but we have many plans for the future. As so many uh, have extended and uh, expressed that they would wish to continue working with Tazos. So uh, what, what more can you say? So I was uh, asked to just pick one and actually it fits very well to the previous talk. So it's uh, uh, Broxe Papadeas, this uh, famous contribution where you have regional climate and uh, you want to know about uh, heat and moisture transport and what it happens in the north and south of the, of the, of the globe. I, I like very much in this work and inspire me a lot to take the ecological uh, relationship series and to, to have them included into our macroeconomic models. But on the other hand, not forgetting macroeconomics, not forgetting the basics, uh, also the dynamic theory, stochastic theory, which all is done by Tassos. So many of our colleagues, when they do climate economics, they tend to forget uh, some, some of the fundamentals. Also, they tend to forget resource economics, which I find is a, is a real pity. I think we need to include this uh, all because we know a lot about it. And then when we combine this, then uh, we have really uh, interesting uh, contributions to the whole climate debate. And one which we try to, uh, one area where we try to contribute um, jointly with Tassos was this um, topic about environmental migration where we have a south and a north, and uh, the south being disproportionately hit by climate change, inducing an environmental migration to the north, and then looking at an overall welfare assessment uh, for uh, migration and the climate change. Some people only look at labor mobilities, others look only at climate change. I think it's important to, to look at both uh, for this important subject. And then, of course, I learned stuff from Tassos, like you know, what I really had as a climate impact assessment was, or an impact factor in his work is called RTC, RE, Regional Transient Climate Response. This is, of course, much cooler. And I, of course, I'm happy to adopt these things in my work as well. And then not only theory, also Tassos is 
famous in my view for uh, producing very nice figures. As you can see it on the left hand side, this is now from our migration paper. One sees this face diagram, uh, migration converging to a steady state, which we are very actually happy to, to be out and have an analytical solution for that in a very complex model, with including many things like resource extraction, uh, knowledge accumulation, all these things, north south relationship, and consumption being growing over time and not stopping to grow unless uh, the research uh, sector becomes inactive in the very long run. So all this is uh, worked out very nicely and then TAS has provided very nice figures which are intuitive and which uh, all the readers are very much like, of course. And this inspired me on the right-hand side. This is also work in progress, uh, something I'm working currently on the way to net zero. Uh, I want to find out, you know, coming uh, from this vi variety of social shared socioeconomic pathways to something more reasonable, what I call economic pathways, also producing nice figure, hopefully nice figures for consumption, for population growth, and for, for the emissions uh, development, which would show how we should go up uh, in, in the next, um, well, 40 years to really be a net zero in the mid of the century. But let me say also, I mean, personality of Tassos is for me key, as I would say, uh, Tassos is really famous, uh, maybe one of the fam most famous colleagues I do have. Uh, and uh, also there is another friend, as you can see, and you probably see the fingers here on the shoulder. So many people are very good friends to Tassos. And he's also a reliable co-author. Uh, you see on the slide that the co-author, which of course uh, is always there, um, is, is also still uh, um, working with him. So very reliable to all his friends who are co-authors. But not only to those, it was also said to the community, Tassos is always working for, for the community like, uh, well, like crazy. Actually, this uh, picture is not really like a social worker, it's more like a businessman or like a banker, but I mean, he's, he's very serious. Actually, it's, I think it's the official uh, picture from the 2017 organization committee where the ERI was in Athens. So uh, approximately every second or third ERI conference is mainly uh, organized by Tassos or he's involved in, in many activities there. And if he doesn't do ERIs, he has his uh, journals, international journals. If he doesn't do the international journals, he has Greek journals. And if he doesn't do that, then he's helping out anywhere. And also with uh, activities, which is not uh, see, visible to anybody, but uh, done in a very reliable and very, very uh, qualitatively high uh, level, which is highly, highly appreciated. And finally, uh, I want to say Tassos is just also a very cool person. You see him in other, in other sunglasses. We have seen others before. So explaining the young generation where to go very clear his uh, finger and very clear the direction where uh, in future uh, directions will be and where uh, the, the uh, proficiency of our uh, colleagues should uh, go. So life is not over, life goes on. Many have extended, well, have expressed they want to continue working with you, Tassos. We hope that you have many, many nice and productive years ahead of you. So all the best and uh, good luck from here from Switzerland. And I hope to see you soon. And I think we will, indeed, we will meet very, very soon. Lovely, Lucas. Very nice presentation. And indeed, the, your pathways to net zero are not just nice figures, is what the world needs in order to make this transition on which our survival depends. So uh, thank you for your amazing work and thank you for being here with us. The next speaker is Professor David Zipperman. Uh, David is Another very important figure in the economics of uh, environment, agriculture, the economics of technology, the economics of risk. Uh, he uh, is a professor at the Agriculture and Resource Economics Department at the Uni uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, he has inspired and affected the work of many of us. Uh, I started in water economics and I, I have the impression that I only read his papers, his uh, really um, um, influential in all the agricultural economics and environmental uh, area. Uh, David, thank you for being here with us. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Very well, very well. Okay, wonderful. It's a real pleasure and a huge honor to, to be here. I, I, I really uh, admire Tassos. I, I, I met him uh, about 30 years ago when he visited Berkeley. 
Uh, I spoke with him and I felt that he was ahead of his time. At the time I was very enamored with uh, heterogeneity and melding economics and biology and its stochastic processes. And Tasso spoke about all this to topic. It was very technical and practical. He used this technique that I, I, I only heard about it, but I could understand it. And most importantly, he could understand me even though I couldn't understand myself. I was interested in water management over time, adoption of drip irrigation. I understood the problem in a dynamic setup. I had a lot of numerical example and economic estimation. I used optimal control with other, uh, other uh, problem, but I spoke, when I spoke with him, it really inspired me to start to look at uh, water allocations, optimal control over space and time. And I have many students that have uh, taken this approach. And uh, then I took this approach for payment for eco ecosystem service, uh, environmental services. But the point that I realized is that he had an incredible influence on me by basically from a, from a small conversation. Later on, I realized that Tassos is really a, a, a quiet, but a daring intellectual uh, lead, uh, leader. He came uh, to Berkeley once in a while because he has family in Monterey. And I really admire how he basically built a career from a Crete and made it an environmental economic me mecca. Again, what was amazing for me was that it was complex but clear. And then he became the editor of EDE. I really I discovered this administrative side, side. Most environmental economists are not don't tend to be great administrator, but he was he has incredible uh, capability. He's brilliant, he's humble and modest, and he made the Zoomer high quality and inclusive. He dared to highlight topics and writers that neglected by others. One of the things that I like that he emphasized the conflict and the synergy between poverty alleviation and development. I, I, I send him, I asked him to have published a special issue on biotech. I, I didn't believe he would take it. He took it. He got a lot of it. I'm, go, I'm sure he didn't agree with everything I did, but as long as the math was right and it makes sense, he accepted it. And, uh, and I really admire it. Not many people would have done stuff like this. Later on, I think that uh, Tassos becomes the cutting end of what I can call econ ecologics, a combination of the two. I realized it when he joined the editorial board of our annual review of resource economics, and later on when he joined the US National Academy of Science. He, he basically continued a tradition that Ero, Mahler, the Skupta, Ardezav, and other established working with Simon Levin to start to develop this incredible alliance of economic and ecology. And uh, when in the annual review of resource economic, he brought this uh, tradition. He wrote papers that brought that, 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 that uh, and he encouraged papers that, that uh, brought dynamic uh, system for the masses. And he identified a lot of creative uh, European and uh, and, and uh, other, uh, other contributors, every type of, and other contributors uh, 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 around the world. His recent uh, stock, uh, work on stock externalities uh, and the joint paper with Simon, I think really established the state of the art on an important area and provides the foundation for the work for generations to come. Okay, so I really want to thank him for being a unique scholar, leader, and a friend, and wish him and us many more productivity. Thank you, Tato. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. The next speaker is Professor Rauf Bukekini.
from Rennes School of Business from the University of Mar uh, Marseille. Uh, Professor Bukekini uh, has worked on economic growth and development, demography and epidemic economic modeling, and he does a lot on operations, research and interdisciplinary applications. Indeed, an impressive uh, CV and an impressive contribution to the generally to the area of economics. So, Professor Pugagini, please, the floor is yours. Boris Nadombris. In a connected. Until we uh, connect with uh, Professor Bukekini, let's uh, move to Ian, uh, Professor Ian Bateman, Exeter University, the editor of our uh, official uh, journal, Environmental and Resource Economics, one of the most important environmental economists in the UK and across the world an amazing CV, uh, a, a person that we all look um, uh, to him in order to get guidance, and his leadership has really shaped the environmental uh, economist ecosystem. We are all grateful to you, Ian, and the floor is you all to uh, talk about DASOS. Ian, we cannot hear you. In a connected, then. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Okay, I apologize for that. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. I am delighted to hear that. Okay. <laughs> well, it's with um, with great pleasure that uh, uh, speaking as the editor of Environmental and Resource Economics, that um, I can announce a special issue uh, to celebrate. Uh, the work of Tassos, uh, essays in honour of Anastasios Zapapadeus. Uh, it will be edited by Phoebe Kanduri, uh, the present uh, president of EAERE, uh, and uh, a former president, Art de Zoo, also Elektra Aligardi, and Anastasios Yanakopoulos. Um, the, uh, the, the, the story of uh, Tassos and the RE goes back a long way, actually. Um, he was uh, a wonderful associate to, uh, to me when uh, I was uh, early on uh, asked to uh, edit the journal. Uh, Tassos came in and was a fantastic steadying hand uh, using his experience of uh, editing in numerous uh, top flight journals uh, to help uh, steer uh, ERE on its uh, present successful course. Um, he rejoined as a co-editor uh, from 2016 and has uh, maintained uh, that steadying influence uh, right through to the present day. And I hope he carries on uh, long into the future. I don't see retirement as, as uh, applying to the journal whatsoever. So the special issue uh, that uh, Phoebe and colleagues are going to uh, edit uh, has a real uh, variety of themes. And that variety reflects uh, the breadth of Tassos's research. So we're looking for papers in spatial economics and pattern formation. That's my particular uh, interest and uh, Tassos has been absolutely seminal in this area. Also looking at the effects of risk and ambiguity in uh, economic uh, uh, dynamics and control. Resource economics, you've already heard uh, from Mart uh, about uh, a variety of uh, dynamic games. Uh, Tassos's uh, work with Simon Levin and others 
uh, uh, leads us to bring in the theme of socio-ecological uh, adaptive systems. And of course, uh, Tassos was a very early leader in the uh, debates around environmental policy and market structure. And when you look through this variety of contribution, uh, the name that you see uh, consistent, consistently is indeed Tassos Zapadeus. He has had a fundamental influence upon the environmental, economic and resource economic literature. So uh, all speakers are invited to submit uh, papers for review. Obviously, all uh, papers have to go for uh, external peer review. Uh, also, we're going to advertise for further submissions. And if you're interested in submitting, please do via the journal website, simply choosing the special issue option, Essays in Honour of Tassos Zapapadeus. And I would like to finish by simply saying a personal thank you to Tassos, um, not just for his contribution to the literature, which others um, have, uh, have um, uh, catalogued uh, in, in a way much better than I can, but just a personal thanks for his consistent and fabulous support uh, for the journal um, throughout uh, the last two decades. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you very much, Tassos. Please do carry on. Best wishes. Thank you so much, Ian. So this was not a farewell. This was a celebration of an amazing scientist. This celebration will be diffused across all the members of ERI and beyond in this uh, video. And I will not say anything more because, I, I, you know, it has been said by more important people than me. I will just ask Tassos to come here and give us a few closing remarks. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you all. Well, I thought that was retiring, but it seems that it doesn't seem so. Yeah, it doesn't seem so. Well, dear friends and dear colleagues, first of all, I'd like to, to express my gratitude to all of you, and especially uh, Phoebe uh, that set up the whole thing, uh, but also to George Economides, the head of our department, was his idea, the whole thing. Dimitris Buradonis, the rector, Thomas Mutos, uh, the dean, and of course, Panos Hachipanayotu and, and Fabio that helped with the organization and the whole group here, Maria Lambrou, and, and the whole group here, all the colleagues that helped having such a fantastic uh, event with, uh, I was very impressed with the, uh, with, the, with the internet uh, connections, everything looked well, fine, so it, it, it's fantastic. So I'd like to thank you all. I also like to extend my thanks to everybody that participated uh, in this event and, and made this uh, event so special to me. Uh, I'd like to thank Letra and Art for making the trip from Italy and, and Holland to, to be here. Uh, let me say that over the course of my career, uh, I had, I was fortunate uh, to serve as a professor at three great universities, University of Crete, uh, Athens University of Economics, and the University of Bologna, where I'm still teaching there. I started my academic career at the economics department in Crete, and uh, which was newly formed department. Uh, George Agnès made the whole uh, introduction. There with George, uh, we started the department, we built the department with other colleagues, I would like to mention here uh, George Tafakis uh, and Vasilis Kardasis, and my good friend and colleague since, uh, my, since our graduate studies in Manchester, Thanasis Papadopoulos, for, for, for working on the department, helping each other, uh, starting a new department, as George Anya said, from nothing. There were no books, there was, there was nothing in economics, but we made it. And I think we made it good, and, and I feel very proud uh, that this department is still going strong. 
then, many years later, uh, George Zanyas, uh, as he said, was instrumental to my move from Crete to Athens. Uh, and uh, we ended up from sharing the same office uh, to have uh, our offices next to each other uh, in Asoya. But uh, when I joined this department, the Department of International European Economic Studies, I became part of a great group of high caliber colleagues. And, and I'm very proud for being uh, part of this department. Despite the difficult times of the recent years, and everybody knows what I'm talking about, the department of the university uh, fought successfully to maintain the quality and to expand teaching and research activities and has thus retained and enhanced its reputation for excellence. This is very important that uh, the department and the Athens University of Economics and Business is an excellent university, both in teaching and research, and this is due to its members. About five or six years ago, Eletra, and I'm very happy to see her here, suggested that I consider the joint affiliation with the University of Bologna. I thought about it very carefully. Uh, the University of Bologna was founded in 1088, and it is the oldest continuously operating university in the world. Its economics department is among the best in Europe, and it was looking to expand its focus on environmental economics. So it was, as you might say, an offer that I couldn't refuse. So uh, I joined the uh, University of Bologna and I'm very happy to be its member. Now, perhaps the, the, the Department of Economics where I started was new and small. And the few colleagues I was working with uh, were at different research uh, ideas and research different interests. So quickly, I saw the value of association uh, with academic institutions that uh, other than the university that I was working with. And I wouldn't repeat uh, my research with the different people, but uh, I started with uh, David Zilberman and Ariel Dinar in Berkeley. Uh, my, co my cooperation with them continues up to the present. And I'm very proud for being uh, friends and colleagues with them. Uh, I would say that the collaboration that played a defining role in my career was with the Bayer Institute of the Royal Swedish Academy of Science. The Bayer Institute added under the really visionary leadership of Carl Joran Mader, who sadly is not longer with us, and Sir Partha Daskupta, that spoke earlier, create a unique environment and basically, I, I think, as, as Partha said, created uh, uh, ecological economics. It, uh, Partha and Carl Joran uh, brought together economists like Ken Aru and Bob Solo, uh, ecologists and biologists like Paul Ehrlich and Simon Levine, and created a, a group there that was high quality, really high quality. I was really honored to be asked to participate in the Institute of Research and Capacity Building activities, and later on to uh, chair the board. It was a big experience for me, and it's something that basically uh, made a big impact uh, in my career. Uh, the, the, the capacity building uh, and the developing world was, was, was a big lesson for me, both educationally, but also entertaining. I remember uh, Bas Brock in Zimbabwe uh, teaching tap dancing and, and doing optimal control at the same time. I mean, this, this was, great, great uh, periods of time. Uh, I remember uh, trying to keep monkeys from stealing our breakfast, but also some of the economic modeling, some of the equations that he put on the paper. Uh, th these were really great times, uh, both in terms of uh, science, but also in terms of contributing to capacity building and environmental and social economics in the developing world. Uh, the Bayer Group, uh, with people like Simon Levine, Partha Daskupta, Carl Joran Manner, Art De Jou, who was later director of the whole institute, really worked hard 
on developing uh, ecological economics and bringing together uh, new ideas, new methods, uh, and, and trying to advance this uh, type of this area of science. A, a, a big uh, a turning point in this whole uh, exercise uh, was in 1995. When, under the guidance of uh, Partha Dasgupta and Karl Joran Mahler, the Bayer Institute, with the really enthusiastic support of Patrick McCartan from Cambridge University Press, launched the new journal, Environment and Development Economics. The goal of the journal, as uh, David mentioned, uh, was to provide an outlet for developing authors, but also issues relating to environment and development. I felt a deep, a deep commitment uh, to this area. And I went on to serve as editor-in-chief uh, of EDE for 10 years. Art was uh, linked, the link of EDE with uh, Bayer Institute these days. He's still linked with the journal, uh, I think, and I'm still linked through being a member of the uh, editorial board. Today, this journal is among the most respected journals uh, in the area. Later on, I got involved with uh, the uh, European Association of Environmental Resource Economists, uh, which was a model association. TV said at the beginning, it's the largest association uh, in, in environmental economics all over the world. And under the leadership of TV, our current president it will go even further. That's for sure. Well, the, uh, my link with the association taught me uh, how to organize very big conferences. I become <laughs> an expert in conference organization, among other things. Uh, I've participated up to this point in organizing four conferences. The first was in Rethymno. Uh, later on, I was involved with Eftichi. Uh, Eftichi was the main organizer in Thessaloniki. Uh, more recently, uh, Fivi and I organized the conference in Athens, and now with the Letra and a group of other people who are organizing the conference in, uh, in Rio. Uh, so the association was a very, very important aspect of, uh, of my career. The uh, Journal of the Association, Environment and Resource Economics, is among the top journals in the field, and it's going strong under the very successful uh, leadership of Ian Bateman that just spoke. Most of the people, I mean, the people that spoke before uh, spoke about my research, so I won't repeat things, but uh, the things that I keep working on have to do with the special temporal dynamics with uh, Thanasi, uh, climate change economics uh, with the letter, we just explored this 1.5. Uh, famous target. Uh, uh, with Bas Brock, uh, we never stopped working. Uh, now we're doing something about climate change and, 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 and diseases. Uh, with Eftichi, I'm working on, on information uh, activities. Uh, and and I, 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 keep, I keep working. I think it's something that uh, I love uh, to do. Uh, with Effie, which I'm very proud of her and, and, and the way that she developed her career uh, in Uppsala. Uh, we're still working. Uh, it, it seems that uh, the, 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 the recent research that uh, he mentioned sort of invalidated our results uh, because our main results with FIVI was how environmental considerations will break uh, the, the, the create bimodal cities. Uh, but uh, Effie now suggests that uh, working from home will create these uh, uh, cities with uh, one center, not many centers, that, uh, as we've shown in our papers. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to, 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 to mention a few things about uh, the way I see my teaching. I mean, most of the uh, work that we did here uh, was uh, about my research. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed my interactions with my students uh, and felt the responsibility of giving to my students classes based on state of the art of the knowledge. And for me, the vehicle for uh, having good teaching is, is good research. Okay. So my, my idea was to try and pass to my students things uh, that 
were uh, state of the art and, and try somehow to, to intrigue them uh, to go even deeper. This is more easy in, in uh, graduate studies, but, but for me, uh, teaching and research uh, are really perfect uh, complements. Uh, so I've been rewarded to see many of my students go on to careers uh, in academia. It's Fabio here, Vangelis over there, F Effie, uh, and other people that have done uh, really uh, that have done uh, successful academic careers in academia, but also others in, in public service uh, in the private sector. Looking back over my career, uh, I feel a great uh, sense of satisfaction and gratitude uh, because I had the opportunity. I was I was lucky uh, to to work with so many uh, important people, but at the same time to create strong and very good friendship during all this uh, uh, period of time. So I would like to thank you all uh, for being part uh, of this trip. Thank you. Thank you for uh, connecting, being here. The next uh, step is the dinner. And we are really sorry that the virtual friends will not join. But let's join in Rimini, all of us. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you so much, Phoebe. It was a great opinion. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you nice again. to see oh, you. Thank you. All the best. Hi, Buzz. <laughs> working, Tasso. Keep working. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I was retiring. No. Come on. You are young. Nobody's tired here. <laughs>